şey vardı. Tabii ki bunlar COVID ile ilgili değil, daha önceki enfeksiyonlarla ilgili, özellikle C vitamini ile ilgili, D vitamini ile ilgili yapılmış çalışmalar bağışıklıkta güçlü. Uh, to be here and uh, to be with you in this congress. Uh, firstly, uh, I I want to say uh, welcome uh, to the world. Uh, in this section, uh, we will talk about, we will listen uh, your experiences about uh, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, start the chair. And firstly, uh, I want to introduce uh, Alfonso Rodriguez Morales. Uh, uh, are you here, doctor? Doctor Alfonso? I think he is not uh, now here. Maybe Nizar is, if possible. Yes. Yeah, Alphonse is Doctor. connecting. Alphonse is connecting okay. now, I think. Okay, we are waiting. Uh, Professor yeah. uh, Dr. Uh, Alfonso Rodriguez uh, Morales, uh, and I want to introduce uh, him to you. Uh, he is a public health and infection research group, uh, Faculty, of, <coughs> Faculty of Health Sciences uh, from uh, Pereira, Colombia, and uh, he will uh, talk about Uh, the experiences uh, about uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, we are uh, waiting for him. Hello, I am connecting, sorry. Welcome. Okay, thanks uh, in first place uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm glad to, to to be here, discuss a little bit what is going right now in, in some countries in Latin America. Fortunately, um, my experience is, uh, is beyond, uh, not only or, or specifically on my country, on Colombia, but they have, I, I have a lot of uh, work uh, with other countries in the region, including especially right now, the situation in Brazil as well as other countries I, I will discuss uh, later. Uh, uh, for, first of all, well, uh, uh, when this began in, in China, when the uh, epidemic began in, in China, we were very aware about the critical situation this uh, may overcome, not only for countries in Asia, but in, in other regions in the world, and, and indeed, In January of, of uh, this year, uh, through the Latin American Society of Tribal Medicine, in fact, we published a lot of um, recommendations regarding this situation and the, the awareness, especially for the case of, of travelers, because the risk we uh, were uh, suspecting we were uh, to face in, in the near future. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, everybody in the world has been concerned is not only in the region, uh, that it, it, it was sonotic in, in principle, but certainly the diversity of, um, of uh, right now animals that maybe are susceptible to uh, this uh, um, novel coronavirus, the, the SARS-CoV-2, Um, and this is the slide is part of uh, our recent uh, review at clinical microbiology reviews that we published uh, the, this week. And we discussed certainly this and other emerging aspects related to the susceptibility that right now is also concerning here, uh, not specifically in Latin America, but at least in the Americas, in, in United States, with the transmission to certain Uh, other animals from human beings, but certainly here in Latin America, we are now discussing this and we are concerned about this situation in this kind of settings, uh, as is the, the case of home, but also in zoological parts and in farms. Certainly not only this kind of transmission is a matter of concern here in, in Latin America right now, but also uh, is it still not clear other ways of transmission, including the vertical transmission. And certainly here in Latin America, we have uh, uh, report cases with our, with our partners in, uh, in countries such as the case of Honduras in Central America, in pregnant women. We are seeing this right now, although 
certainly there is not enough evidence regarding the, the situation uh, for uh, the case of vertical transmission. But in other countries, Venezuela, which is a very complex situation uh, right now, has been also reported. Venezuela, as we published recently uh, on May in The Lancet, is a very complex epidemiological scenario because before SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, we had a lot uh, of epidemics of different infectious diseases that were not under control of the government because of the uh, large crisis that this country uh, is facing, especially from migration, forced migration to other countries such as Colombia and Brazil, and this add other epidemic diseases in the region, such as the case of dengue, measles, malaria, among many others. Certainly, this epidemic began, in, in, especially in the rest of the world, especially in January, and spread to many other regions in the world, especially Europe. And in fact, in Latin America, most of our cases were precisely received from Europe. This is the case of Brazil that in late February uh, received the first case from Milan, Italy, and other countries, as is the case of Colombia in uh, early March, we received also cases from Italy, but also especially from Spain. As you know, Latin America is very well connected with Spain, and most of our imported cases initially were from Spain and from Italy. But right now, when we are uh, close into 10 million cases in the world, we have in the top 10, four countries, especially is the case of Brazil, but also the case of Peru, Chile, and Mexico in the top 10. And in the near future, we will have other uh, countries from Latin America in the top 10 of the uh, countries with more cases accumulated and daily reported as we may see here in the case of Brazil that right now is in uh, on average uh, reporting most, more cases even than the United States as we discussed in uh, the website of the International Society of Infectious Diseases where I am right now member of the council of this society. And certainly we are struggling in Latin America with this significant increase in the number of cases, not only in, in these four countries, but also in other countries that may be are presenting a silent uh, epidemic, as is the case of multiple uh, Caribbean islands, very small countries with uh, very concentrated epidemics. But certainly in Brazil, the number of cases is quite high, especially in two cities, such as is the case of Sao Paulo, uh, uh, one of the major cities in the region, uh, and in fact, the largest in, this, in the region. And in Rio de Janeiro, they present thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases in, in the last weeks, with a, a, a significant increase in the number of confirmed cases, not only in this region, but in the rest of the country, even in rural areas, with a significant number of increased cases, which uh, by population in certain municipalities is also quite high. But also, as I mentioned, the situation is very complicated if we see the concentration per million people in countries such as Chile, Peru, and uh, certainly in other um, rural and uh, jungle areas of countries such as Ecuador and Peru. This is a very complex situation. In the case of a small country such as Chile, there is a, a concentrated epidemic also in the metropolitan area. In the case of Ecuador, especially in the touristic city of Guayaquil, which is the largest in this country, there is uh, more of the cases in this country that is also facing a dual epidemic with dengue that was in the last year also causing a large epidemic in Latin America. But right now we are facing a loss of co-infections, not only with dengue, but with uh, other respiratory pathogens. But in other countries, this is the case of Peru and Colombia, we are these overlapping epidemics, not only with COVID-19, but also with dengue, as we report uh, recently in the Journal of uh, Medical Virology. Bolivia is another interesting country that right now is increasing in the number uh, of cases. Uh, 
also is the case of Colombia, where I live. In Colombia, we have processed over uh, 700,000 uh, samples uh, for uh, PCR, and we have right now more than 80, 40, 80, uh, 84, thousand cases with, uh, with around 3% only of deaths. This is related to the profile of infected cases, fortunately, which is different to Europe. We have a lot uh, of our cases in young population, no significant difference between uh, uh, sepsis, but uh, importantly, we have more than 40% of our cases related to that, that have recovered, and most of them are uh, on mild disease, which is uh, fortunately because uh, most of our health system is uh, not compromised due to uh, patients with COVID-19 right now. Nevertheless, that uh, percentage of uh, patients that uh, died is uh, related significantly to um, patients with risk factors, not only age, but diabetes, hypertension, among others. As I mentioned, and we have analyzed these two in this paper in travel medicine and infectious diseases, our ICUs are not collapsed yet, fortunately, because our capacity has been increased over the last weeks, and we uh, have uh, uh, mainly mild cases of uh, COVID-19. Nevertheless, the uh, society and the health systems are complex for the situation with COVID-19, certainly because this situation will make a, a complex uh, all the uh, preparedness and re response from the Colombian Association of Infectious Diseases, where I am the vice president. We have been preparing before the arrival of cases, and we have developed and updated three times right now uh, evidence-based guidelines for the uh, diagnosis and management of our cases, considering the arrival of the cases. This, for example, is our second case in the country that was uh, already published uh, in the Annals of Clinical Microbiology. And we have analyzing the clinical, the clinical situation even before the arrival of most of the cases. And this is a systematic review from our group relating uh, that scenario, the clinical scenario, and assessing later with the cases also the risk factors and the outcomes as we have done, for example, in Bolivia, where the main factors associated, associated with fatal outcomes have been the age and high blood uh, pressure as uh, we published in the uh, Italian Journal of Infectious Diseases. We have also uh, seen changes in chains in the uh, clinical findings of the patients. We have uh, looking and experience change in their profile, for example, of uh, the clinical findings to neurological as has been the headache, but especially what has been reported in other countries in, in, in the world, the case of uh, agiusia and anosmia. And this is part of a series that will be published uh, next week, has been already accepted in the Journal of Neurobiology uh, in cases from here, from uh, Venezuela, from Bolivia, and other countries in, in, in, uh, in the continent, as is the case of USA uh, and Germany. Certainly, we were not uh, prepared uh, at all, but this situation, we were, you know, expecting what was not, uh, in fact, expected for many uh, countries in, in the world. But as we usually say here in Latin America, we have more time to prepare for the arrival of the situation that certainly we were sure that it was about to arrive uh, since January and effectively occur, as I mentioned, in late February and right now is uh, disseminated in um, a situation that makes right now Latin America the epicenter of uh, the COVID-19 right now in the world. I will, I will finish uh, just uh, showing uh, the website of our Latin American network of coronavirus disease uh, that I coordinate. You will see uh, our publications and projects uh, and all the things that maybe is interest, interesting for you. And I would like to give you uh, thanks for the attention 
the attention only saying that um, you are invited to Colombia and Latin America in the near future, and especially to Pereira, which is the center of the coffee triangle region, where the poet Luciano Garcia Gomez says that in Pereira, there are no foreigners. We are all Pereirans, and you are invited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I, I hear perfectly. We saw that uh, you have many experiences about COVID-19. Uh, also, you published uh, these uh, experiences. Uh, and uh, I, want, I would like to say thank you for this. Uh, and uh, is there a question about uh, this uh, section? I think uh, there is no question. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your uh, contribution uh, for uh, our Congress. Thank Thanks, you very please. much. Yes. İkinci konuşmacıya geçiyoruz. Yes. Uh, now. Introduce to Nizar. Uh, oh yes. Now uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the second uh, speaker, Dr. Nizar Bahabri. Uh, and uh, he is consultant uh, in internal medic medicine and infection disease uh, in Saudi Arabia. And also uh, he ha has many experiences uh, about uh, COVID-19. And now uh, we'll uh, listen to him. Uh, welcome to Turkey, firstly. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's uh, really a great pleasure. Uh, to be with all of you. Uh, it is an honor really to see all of this great expertise and to be with them. Uh, I cannot say welcome to Turkey because uh, Turkey is like my second home. Uh, I have visited a lot. Uh, they are my friends and my colleagues. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. And I will share some of the expertise in COVID-19 in Saudi. Uh, I hope it will be a little bit helpful. Uh, I started the, the Congress started with Latin America, which great data. I will just concentrate a little bit in Saudi Arabia. So as you all know, Saudi Arabia is uh, living and like the rest of the world, uh, an unconditional time that everyone in each building, every big building in Saudi Arabia says stay home. Every big thing um, we, we've never uh, for any Muslim in, around the world, uh, it means uh, a very significant time to see the Holy Mosque of Mecca is closed. Uh, this is uh, something that unheard of uh, over the centuries. Uh, coronavirus changed how we look at the world. Uh, really this year, the pilgrims, uh, the pilgrim season will be unconditional for the first time maybe since ages, more than hundreds of years, it will be only for the people who are living in Saudi Arabia from different nationalities, and it will be the lowest number ever. So usually Hajj is for around two to three million people. This year it will only take 10,000 maximum uh, people so they can just uh, do the pilgrim season without uh, getting infection. Uh, really, it is, uh, it was a hard time. Like the rest of the world, it was hard for Saudi to manage everything and to get all of the attention for the Muslim people to act, to ask for their understanding that we will close uh, the Holy Mosque for Ramadan and the Holy Mosque for Hajj. And uh, because really it's for Muslims, uh, human life is, is very precious. So uh, very strong decisions had to be taken. I'll go through for the total number I just took for today. So we had uh, 3,927 new cases today. Uh, reco recovery is 1,657. And we have an, uh, 37 deaths. Uh, tests per day in the kingdom reached today the highest number since the starting of the epidemic, it reached 44,275 tests that were done with a positive ratio of uh, reaching 0.9% today. 
uh, and uh, the critical cases increased by nine. This is the total accumulative cases since the beginning of uh, the, the episode. Our first case was on the 2nd of March. So we are running now around week number 17. And uh, the co total confirmed cases is 178,000. Uh, active is 54, and we have a total recovery of 122,000. We are reaching nearly 70% of the total population that is recovered. I'll just give attention that we have a total number of critical cases. Critical cases uh, in, in the whole kingdom is reaching 2,283. Uh, that's really the highest number that we've reached since the beginning. And uh, we have different experiences since the beginning of the 2nd of March. We were a little bit different from the rest of uh, maybe actions that were taken in different countries. Saudi Arabia were very strict in, in closing everything from the second case arrived to the kingdom. So international flights were closed, uh, local flights were, were banded, uh, uh, the holy mosques were closed, mosques for prayer were closed, uh, then shopping malls, then we had a restriction on time, then we had uh, 24 hours curfew, all of those were a very strong measures not to have a lot of critical cases that will paralyze the healthcare system. We started in the beginning by every positive case will be admitted either to a hospital or to a hotel. Nobody stays with his family. Now after transmission, uh, now after the week number 15, we started to do home isolation. We started to do other things. So even if it was an asymptomatic case in Saudi in the beginning of the, of the epidemic, we've kept it either in a hospital or in, in a hotel. Uh, but he cannot uh, really go around uh, and, uh, for the whole community. We also uh, took very strong measures about having two negative swabs before the patient can be discharged. And this really caused a significant delay in the number of uh, recovered patients. Uh, this is just a total, I know it's written in Arabic, but I'll just try to modify some on, on those ones. So now the R0, as of today, it's 0.78 around the kingdom. And uh, we are now since three days, four days, one week, sorry, one week, we are since one week, we are now back to normal life with 24 hours, uh, no care for you anymore. Uh, and uh, we are unfortunately still just trying to deal with the uh, critical cases. The highest number we reached since the beginning of the 16 was on this day, which was the 16th of June, it was 4,919. As you can see, this is from the beginning of March. Then it went up and down. Now we are running. I want just to tell you that here we had uh, around maybe had 24 hours curfew of the whole kingdom, 24 hours. Unfortunately, then we came in like the celebration of Eid, which is like a, a whole uh, like um, a holidays around the world. Uh, like Christmas in different countries. This time, people went to their families and slipped over with big amount of numbers. Afterward, we had a huge amount of increase of critical cases because elderly were infected. Uh, just to keep in mind, uh, we've reached now, uh, in the week 16, we had 27,373 uh, tests per day. It was the positive were 16.1. In the last week, in the past one week, we increased the testing up to, as I said in the beginning, 44,000. And now the positive cases are around 0.9%. It was yesterday 10.2. Today is uh, 0 .9 per, uh, uh, sorry, 9%. We always have a huge number of males compared to females, 66 
to 70 to 80 percent are males compared to 20 are females. We had middle age, 86 percent. Elderly above 65 were only 4 percent. We have since the beginning of, you can see, from week number one until week number 17, those are uh, the accumulative cases and you can see we were a little bit going slow until as I said after the curfew we had this increased jump because of uh, people gathered together. Uh, unfortunately elderly were only three percent since the beginning until we reached this week when they gathered with their uh, grandfather and grandmothers then our elderly jumped to six and seven percent and this is why we have a lot of critical cases now this is the highest number of critical cases that we reached on children are around 10 percent have been between seven to ten percent of the total new cases every day since the beginning of uh, of it uh, the death uh, is increasing as you can see it's all about the same time that I mentioned again and again, unfortunately, we were in a very good control with the public until eight time, then elderly were infected, then uh, deaths were increased. And now the total death is around 1,500 deaths per week. And here, as you can see, this is the number of recovery of cases, just to tell you, here in week number nine, the new strategy of accepting people do not have to take two negative swabs before the shot. So if he is 10 days asymptomatic, he does not need to repeat the swab again for recovery and he can be announced as recovered. So this has changed the whole number of recovery because the definition of recovery have changed from this week, uh, week number nine. So it used to be two negative swabs, then changed to 10 days of being asymptomatic. He is uh, at recovery. Just this is an example of my city. It's one of the uh, plateau cities in around uh, the kingdom. Jeddah is uh, one of the second largest city in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we have around 500 new cases around the weeks. Um, the largest was 500, the highest was 586 on the 30th of May. Uh, this is also where after Eid, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the R0 or R0 in different large cities, as you can see, this is uh, by week 17, which we are on now. Uh, this is Riyadh, the capital, 0.26, Jeddah is 0.81. Mecca is 0.9, Medina is 1 point. Those are the largest. Now we have a problem here in Hafuf, the eastern region, where the oil and the Gulf and those ones, they did not have a high numbers except in the last three weeks. Now they are the source of the highest number around in Saudi Arabia. This is just to give you an idea about uh, the Gulf area. Saudi is in the first column. So, uh, the number of percentage of uh, positive cases compared to tested in Saudi is 12.3 percent. In Kuwait, in uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, it's 1.5. And as you can see, the number of tests that uh, United Arab Emirates did were around 300,000. Uh, they are per 1 million. So they are the highest, one of the highest. Gulf states that did the testing. Next is Bahrain. They have done 276 for every million population. And this has helped them a lot in controlling, as you all know, in controlling the, the disease, uh, because as much as you can test fast. And now Saudi, in the last four weeks, they have done their uh, relationship agreement with China. And China, when with the Ministry of Health started working together now uh, for the last three weeks to increase the testing in Saudi Arabia significantly. For the treatment, just to, uh, I will just say, uh, one thing that we've done in the, our recommendation in the kingdom is to start aggressive uh, as soon as we have 
a suspicion of cytokine storm will start aggressive treatment uh, in the form of antiviral if it's mild or moderate. But as soon as it is severe with one of the criteria of severity, then we will start dexamethasone and antiretroviral, uh, antiviral, sorry. If it is critical, which is now people are even considering, so now we are treating in the last three weeks, around the kingdom, whenever we have a ferritin of more than 600 or anything that can indicate a cytokine storm, we are using high methyl prednisolone, a dose of 40 milligram BID plus interleukin-6 inhibitor. And we've really seen great results to control uh, the disease if you start early and you do not wait for people to be sad. So as soon as they require oxygen, before they go into the critical zone, we will start aggressive steroids and uh, anticoagulation, either therapeutic full anticoagulation if you have a, di a D dimer of more than 0.5 or 1, full anticoagulation compared to uh, prophylactic for everyone else. So, this has really helped in trying to decrease the number of critical and death around the kingdom. Our mortality rate is around less than 1%, uh, around 0.78 compared to the cases. Uh, by this, I conclude my presentation. I hope I have been in time uh, to share some of the experiences we had uh, in Saudi Arabia, and I'm ready for any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nazar Bahabri. It's an uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the Hajj is very, very important uh, for the Muslim, and I know many people are waiting for the opening of the uh, Hajj. Also, I hope uh, this uh, pandemic uh, finish and uh, all of the world uh, will yeah. meet uh, their uh, uh, religion yeah. places also. And uh, there is a question also. Two yeah. questions. Please, uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, if you want to ask, uh, please. Uh, uh, Nezar, very really thank, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, I'm Mustafa Altindis, and Hi. I think two or three questions for you. Uh, yeah. One question is, how many percentage to asymptomatic suffer from the uh, COVID-19 in Saudi Arabia? Did you know? Uh, so asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic yeah. population were around, in the last published data from Ministry of Health, we're around 18%. 18? 18%. We did active surveillance uh, yeah. in week number six and week number seven around the kingdom. They were, uh, they were around 18. In some cities, they reached 26%. Mm. And another question is, is it enough to stay home? Is the possible the end of the a pandemic. No, it wasn't. It wasn't really, uh, as you know, it's not. It's not uh, uh, really uh, uh, for the end of the pandemic. It was mainly to reorganize our uh, our system, uh, increase the ICU bed capacity. It was to get uh, more testing uh, material, uh, more labs to be functional. As as you you are saying, absolutely, it's not the end of the pandemic. This is why. The public cannot understand why are we opening everything back to normal life when the numbers are much higher compared to the curfew time. But we are saying the Ministry of Health said it was the time that we needed to reorganize our things. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, another question for you and your for country is another question is would you like to point out the differentiation to between MERS coronavirus and pandemia and then COVID-19 pandemia in your country? What do you think to differentiation in that country? It was the transmission. The transmission was yeah. totally different. The number of transmission was totally different and the number of cases. And I have to tell you, Really, it was around people who are dealing with camels, uh, mares. But this one is different. This one, as you all see in different parts of the world, it was uh, so fast. Yeah. And another question is, do you have any data or experience about mares coronavirus infected and record uh, patient get infected to uh, COVID-19 
protected or uh, is there any differentiation to uh, another? Uh, uh, uh, really, the number of cases of MERS CoV, uh, there are one uh, uh, research center who dealt with MERS CoV is trying to work this great question that you had. But you know that the total number was around 2,000 only. Uh, they are trying to catch if they see if there is uh, immunity or not, but uh, there is no published data yet. Mm. And what about, uh, what's the rate of children in your country, COVID-19 infected person? Around Sorry? 8, 8, 8 to 12 percent. 8, 12 percent. Okay. Uh, all across. Now oh, in no. the last couple of weeks, it was around 10 percent, but a lot of them are holding the disease majority are asymptomatic they were just tested with their families or if they will have they will have one or two days symptoms and then they will resolve and there is no relation to climate or uh, yeah hot I, or I, cold. I hot, hot and cold you know unfortunately i keep on even educating the public that unfortunately heat and cold cannot be uh, uh, done in Saudi very easy because unfortunately even the most crowded area the lowest psychoeconomic classes in Saudi even the whole districts that have a lot of people in it mm. everyone have an air condition really we, we don't live outside for a long period of time mm. uh, everything is air conditioned everything everything <laughs> yeah, I know I so, know. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is why is I there think a distinction to Is there a distinction to climate, climate or yeah, uh, climate th conditions? Is, yeah, there is, there is always the temperature is around yeah. 22 or 21. So <laughs> how can we judge yeah. the sun or the hot climate? It's really very difficult for us to judge it. Friends, uh, sorry, another question. What's the right time to begin to, to see the up? Uh, when to start to uh, see up for therapy? We are doing it if, uh, uh, if the uh, ferritin is more than 600 mm. and the patient is requiring uh, even one liter of oxygen uh, or if he doubled his ferritin within two days, within 24 hours, it used to be 300 and then it's 600 or 200 and then it's 400 or the oxygen requirement is increasing. Mm. As soon as you hit with early, uh, Tulisizumab plus uh, methyl prednisolone really it does do a great job a great mm -hmm. job okay. last question sorry is there any relationship is there any correlation with CT PCR CT results to clinical situation in your patients uh, yes uh, so uh, really in the first as uh, I believe the data is everywhere, but uh, what, we, what we've seen also is the same. Third day of a fever, the best time to have the most sensitive uh, swab. Yeah. Uh, if the patient is in the first two days, it drops. If the patient is after the fifth day, sensitivity drops below 30%. Okay. okay, thank you very much for your nice presentation and a lot of answer to uh, Thank questions. you very much for the invitation. Thank you. See you soon, hopefully. Thank you very much again. Yes. Uh, Professor Tuva Dal is, you can uh, speak, okay. you can call the next speaker. Uh, Our next yes, speaker uh, Marta, from Italy. Yes, yes. From Italy. Uh, I'm wandering to Italy as last station. Uh, yes, also it is. And <laughs> praying for the Italy and uh, also for all of the world. Uh, she is from Infection Disease and Tropical Medicine Residency Program uh, from uh, Pavia, Italy. Welcome. Uh, we are listening uh, to you. So, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I will touch briefly on the points that may generate interest in the COVID-19 outbreak in, in my country, that is Italy. Uh, well, Italy has been one of the earliest and most affected countries by the COVID-19 with a total of almost 240,000 confirmed cases. And we also had uh, like 35,000 deaths as of 24 June 2020 when I prepared these, uh, these slides, this presentation. Well, what's happened? Since the first case has been recorded in the province of Lodi, so northern Italy, on 21st February 
restrictions measures uh, uh, have been issued by the Italian government until the whole country was put on lockdown on 8 March. Uh, so movement across the whole Italian country was possible only for urgent needs and must be proven by self-certification and commercial activities have been put uh, shut down except for ones providing the basic necessities and services and access to work sites was limited as well. Smart working was encouraged whenever possible. And schools, universities, and cultural institutions have also been shut down. So those lockdown revolutions remain in force until the 3rd of May. Uh, so the 3rd of May for our country marked the beginning of the so-called phase two. And that's because the government was facing an increasing pressure to loosen COVID-19 regulations in order to fight an inevitable threat of economic recession. And so uh, from Wednesday, June um, 3rd, travel between all regions was once again possible. Uh, so um, I think so far, lockdown measures were surely effective. So the rate of contagion slowed down to a plateau and possible, uh, the peak was anticipated. As we can see here with the red line, uh, we reached the peak on uh, the, the, the 21st of March. And then, as we can see here, the, t the total number of cases, as we already said, is almost 240,000. Uh, the, the green line is the yield, and the pink line is the actually positive cases, while the, uh, the, the black line, of course, are the dead. I, I want to say something about uh, the dead, oh, sorry, the dead in Italy. Um, uh, in Italy, we had a lot of elderly people dying for this infection. Mean age was 80 years, that, that's a lot, and 20 years higher as compared with the national sample diagnosed with infection. Um, so uh, we recently published a modeling paper in Nature Medicine, me and my staff, and we estimated the model parameters based on data from 20 February, that was the day one, to five of 46, uh, and the show spread of epidemic. And we also modeled possible longer term scenarios. And that's incredible because we, uh, we, we can see uh, that our predictions were actually true. So the scenario fit with the data we showed before. As you can see with the, with the blue line, the cumulative infected reached the 0.5% of the entire Italian population, that is of uh, 60 million of people. Uh, so around 300,000 uh, uh, of infected cases. Um, uh, so when we modeled the epidemic in our paper on natural medicine, we used the real basic reproduction number R note Italy. And this was really high at the beginning. It was of 2.38. But just on day four, as a result of the introduction of the basic social distancing and the fear, just the fear of common people about the, about the infection, our note was 1.66. And then when national lockdown was strictly enforced, it finally reached the value below one. So what now? Maybe we, we should talk about RT instead of R node. RT is the virus actual transmission rate at a given time, and the given time is T, of course. And as we can see now, region by region in Italy, it, it's below one, except for one case. Can you see it? It's Lazio. And Lazio is the region where Rome, the capital of, uh, the capital of Italy is, Rome. In Rome, the RT is now above one. And that's just because Rome is leading now a little outbreak. It's confined now in a, in a house for elderly people, but it's there is, and it's above one. That's why the pandemic is not over and we, we, we should pay attention. Um, the question of why uh, the virus, uh, the, the pandemic was not the same in, in all Italy, but uh, the question of why the virus has has been so lethal in Italy's richest region, which is Lombardy. Uh, the Lombardy is in northern, in, in nor northern Italy, where I come from, where I was born, and where I'm working now uh, as an AD specialist. 
And the question of why the virus, the virus was uh, so lethal in, in this region is yet unsolved. Uh, some theories include Lombardy's close trade right ties with China and the rest of the world, or population density or high levels of pollution, but the truth is that we don't know. We don't have any idea of why. And this field opens a lot of polemics in our country. Um, another polemic is about swoops. As you can see here, the total cases with the red line and total number of performed swoops in the gray line. And just now it is increasing. At the, at the beginning, it was very low, maybe the lowest in Europe, I don't know, probably it's the, it's the lowest. The daily average number of swoops in Lombardy was less than 40 every 100,000 inhabitants over the last, uh, uh, let's say, three months. And that's incredible. Moreover, I want to show you these. Uh, well, uh, these, these uh, uh, are the admission in a hospital. In darker red, we can see uh, the ICU hospital admission. In the lighter red, we can see the, the general hospital admission. And in pink, we can see the domestic isolation. Uh, so, as we can see, in the first April, uh, we had 29,000 hospitalized patients. And let's think about the actual hospitalized patients. We're now just uh, 1,500. So now it's like paradise in comparison with before. We had a real war and real tough uh, times. Um, let's say, let me say how my hospital uh, my hospital is Policlinico San Matteo of Pavia, Northern Italy, in Lombardy, uh, reacted to this pandemic. Uh, the hospital has been involved in, in the management of the outbreak since it, its inception. And we published this paper talking about how we transformed our building, our job, and for sure what we didn't talk about in this paper, of course, our lives. And the circle shows our standalone building of infectious diseases the ground floor with the ID outpatient clinic and two floors of inpatient for a total of 44 patients. On day one of the pandemic, the outpatient clinic was just closed. It was just closed, like forever, till now. And between days two and three of the outbreak, regular patients were discharged or transferred to other wards. And by day five, all the 44 beds in the ID ward were occupied by 19 patients. And within the first week of the outbreak, uh, the first floor was transformed into a sub-intensive case uh, care ward. Um, it was a contaminated zone, and we can see it in the red color in the figure here too. And on day nine, also the ground floor was compared to the internet and in particular, an infectious diseases emergency area. In just 24 hours, so we created this one, the red one. So uh, ER, in summary, in less than two weeks, uh, let us say in less than 10 days, the ID division managed to more than double its total capacity for regular, of, uh, regular beds from 44 to 94, create a sub-intensive ID war, and create an ID emergency department with 16 beds for acute care, thanks to the joint efforts of 16 ID specialists and 12 ID residents. And we didn't have a huge spread of infection within the healthcare workers. This, of course, is due to the PPE that we used every day since day one. And moreover, when we swapped, because we swapped the contaminated areas, uh, to look for the virus, and we recently published a paper on the subject. We didn't find the virus, except for only two samples uh, from the CPOP helmet, the external surfaces, but with a very, very, very low RNA level. So probably the, the virus was not affecting any, uh, anymore. Um, and uh, what did we do? Let me finish with this. Uh, despite the slide that, of course, is a joke, uh, we had benefit from an everyday meeting at 1 p.m. and pneumologists, emergency medical doctors, infective virologists, of course, anesthesiologists and public health and medical management doctors and also psychologists participated in this meeting every day at 1 p.m. And the meeting was divided in half. In the first part, we discussed the therapies, uh, examinations to be requested for these patients, and also researches uh, available to treat them. 
And the second part was literature, was science. Um, everyone with their own expert opinion made available the knowledge that they had learned in the fields, in the literature, or by other colleagues in other hospitals. And all together we looked for the right way. But did we really find the right way? Uh, well, I, I, I can't answer, maybe, maybe not, but probably we learned something at the end. And gradually and slowly and unfortunately maybe together with the patients. And the most important message to my opinion when talking about treatments for the sad and violent infection is that time and timing is gold. That's for sure. That's for all the treatments we know. Thanks for your attention. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kulaneri, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you, you can hear me. Uh, I hope uh, again uh, we will vi visit uh, Italy. Also, I like Italy, this beautiful country. And uh, this uh, pandemic finish, and uh, we meet again uh, Roma. Um, and uh, now uh, my mm -hmm. friend, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Uh, Mehmet Özdemir. Can yes. I ask? I think it's one ask, question. Uh, uh, uh, can I ask Dr. Marta, please? Sorry? There is a question, I think. For Dr. Marta. Yeah. Hi, from Hi. Saudi. Uh, I, I mean, uh, we learned a lot from the Italian, uh, I mean, literature and what they dis describe about uh, anticoagulation. Can you tell me your experience? So I will tell you the recommendation uh, about starting anticoagulation came all from Italy to us, so we put the recommendation. How is your experience now with full anticoagulation compared to prophylactic? Well, no, just prophylaxis for us. Uh, it's a kind of strange prophylaxis, and um, to be honest, uh, because it's like uh, um, a little bit more than prophylaxis and a little bit less of anticoagulant therapy. Uh, let's say that if I, if I will be uh, hospitalized with COVID-19, probably uh, they will give me uh, like 6,000 units of enoxaparin instead of, of 4,000, that it's the normal prophylaxis. Okay, thank you. And another two questions uh, for uh, Marta. Uh, one, one first question is, Italian scientists made a phylogenetic viral analysis between northern and uh, south part of Italy. Do you know any uh, differences? I, I know about the northern part. I know that, yes, uh, the, the scientists, the virologists uh, did it, but I don't know if there are uh, uh, any so. differences. I think it's, uh, it's the question of the year, I think, <laughs> because there is something strange in Lombardy. Hmm. It's not just the north and the south, it's something strange in Lombard itself. Because other regions of the northern part of Italy, um, they, they, they had, hadn't been eaten so much. And another question, thank you. Do you think hypertension drugs have an effect on COVID-19 patient in your country? Sorry, what, what kind of drugs? Hypertension, hypertension, uh, hypertension. hypertension. No, I, I don't think so. And I also have a, a colleague, a cardiologist, uh, who published a, recently published a, a paper uh, about that. Hypertension, uh, like, like, like the disease, of course, it has as a, um, a big part. But uh, anti-hypertensive drugs, no, I don't think so. Do you know a uh, asymptomatic person for COVID-19 percentage in your country, uh, is there any, I think is, there is uh, there are a lot of studies. Yeah, uh, uh, the studies uh, are on course actually, are, are, are just ongoing. I know that some engineering uh, are trying to estimate the, the, the hidden part of this infection. I think it's very important because the asymptomatic and so the undiagnosed cases is a great part, I think. Maybe it's greater than we know now. And so the, the starting going, I think, uh, I think we, we will have some surprises from that. Thank you again. Um, I think there's a new question. Um, 
Thank you very much again. A very nice presentation, nice comments and, and answer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Özdemir and uh, invite to next speaker, I think. Yes, Mehmet Özdemir. Thank you for, for presentation. Now uh, we are uh, we are continuing with uh, Dr. Gumral Alakorova from Azerbaijan. Uh, she is uh, she is president of Az. Saygı değer hocalarım, değerli katılımcılar, iyi akşamlar. Özellikle Mustafa hocama çok teşekkür ederim daveti için. Çok güzel, çok verimli bir sempozyum oldu. Çok bilgilendik. Bu dönemde aslında kongrelere katılmak şansımız bile olmadığı için bayağı bir ilaç gibi geldi. İki gün tam katıldım diyebilirim. Çok teşekkür ederim. Ben de bizim kendi sürecimizi anlatacağım. Çok kısa bir e, e, özet geçeceğim. E, Azerbaycan'daki sunumumu görüyorsunuz değil mi? Paylaşıldı mı? Devam edebilirsiniz hocam gayet iyi. Evet. E, Azerbaycan'daki süreci anlatacağım. Laboratuvarda neler yaptık biz? İlk vakamız 28 Şubat'ta 2020. yılda İran'dan geç olan bir Azerbaycan vatandaşında saptandı. Biliyorsunuz Azerbaycan İran sınırıyla sınırında bir ülke. Şu andaki durumumuz bugüne kadar total yapılan test sayısı 456 bin test yapıldı. 15.368 vaka görüldü. Ölüm sayısı 187. İyileşme 8367, aktif hasta sayısı 13845, ağır e, yoğun bakımda yatan hasta sayımız 174 ve e, o, geri kalan diğer kısmı ise mekanik ventilasyona bağlı olan hastalar. E, özellikle e, hasta yaş grubuna dikkatinizi çekmek isterim. Azerbaycan'da 50-59 yaş arasındaki hasta yaş grubumuz %21'den oluşmaktadır. Ee, nüfusun e, yaşına bağlı olarak, olarak mesela yurt dışında baktığımız zaman çalışmalara hepsinde e, daha çok 65 yaş üstü, 70 yaş üstünde olmasına e, bakmayarak bizim ülkemizde e, %21'i 50-59 ve %16'sı ise 60-69 yaştan oluşmaktadır. Ee, 13.845 vakamız var. Onlardan %21.8'i semptomatik, geri kalanı ise asimptomatik olarak belirilmektedir. Ee, hafif olarak %7.6 olarak geçirmektedir. Orta ağır %8, ağır %6.1, kritik hasta sayımız ise %2.1 olarak belirilmektedir. Diğer e, dünya, e, dünya ile karşılaştırdığımız zaman, diğer ülkelerle de karşılaştırdığımız zaman bizde kadın hastalarımız daha çok. Yüzde 54 kadın hastalar, yüzde 46 e, erkek hastalar olarak bildirilmektedir. Bu ise e, bizim e, normalde şöyle bir süreç izlem yapıldı. Mart 24'ten Nisan 20'ye kadar bir karantina süreci olur, yapıldı ve o dönemde gördüğünüz gibi burada da e, mavi renk olanlar yeni bulaş, e, kumülatif olanlar e, turuncu renk olarak e, gösterilmiştir. Ve Nisan Mart'tan Nisan'a kadar bir e, ciddi şekilde iniş saptamaktayız. Ama 27 Nisan'dan sonra şartların normalleşmesiyle bizde bir yükselme saptandı. Bunlar ise gün olarak saptamaktayız. En son Haziran ayında pardon bir katayım, bir kapatayım. Ha, Haziran ayın 24'ünde 590'a ulaşmaktayız. Şunu söyleyebilirim. Başlangıç süreçimizde bizde vaka sayısı çok fazla değildi. Ancak bir bu normalleşme sürecinden sonra bu Nisan 27'sinden sonra ilk Mayıs ayının haftalarından sonra Azerbaycan'da ciddi şekilde bir yükselme saptandı. 
Bunu da daha çok e, sosyal mesafeyi koruma, e, sosyal mesafeyi koruma ve maske kullanımına bağlı olarak bizde şartlar biraz hafifleştikten sonra bu şartlara çok dikkat edilmediğini kanaatindeyiz. Burada çok net olarak görülmektedir e, şu tabloda e, Nisan 20, 26 ve 27, 3 Mayıs'tan sonra e, haftalık e, e, bulaş sayımız bayağı e, yükseldi ve en son 19 Temmuz'da e, pardon 19 Haziran'da e, yeniden bir e, karantina süreci başlandı. Son e, bu artık ikinci haftamız. E, yeniden geri dönersek 590'dan sonra 547, 517 bugünkü sayımız ise 527 olarak saptanmaktadır. Karantina süreci başladıktan sonra e, birazcık e, çok fazla değil de çok, biraz inişe gittik Ama ancak dediğim gibi daha önce baş, başlangıçta çok ciddi e, bir karantina rejimi uygulandı. O dönemde e, 3 Mayıs, 4 Mayıs'a kadar bunlarda iniş saptadık. Daha sonra karantina normalleşmesiyle biz de bunu artık e, ilk dalga bile söyleyebiliriz. İkinci dalga değil mi dememiz çok doğru olmaz ama ilk dalgamızı şimdi yaşıyoruz bile diyebiliriz. Ee, şunu özellikle vurgulamak isterim. Ee, burada gördüğünüz gibi bu tabloda hem iyileşmiş hem yeşil renk olanlar, iyileşenler, mavi, yeni bulaş ve ölenlerin e, sayısı görülmektedir. Ee, bizde e, ölüm sayısı e, bulaş sayısına kıyaslarken çok fazla olmadığı görülmektedir. Yani günlük 4, 6, 5, 7 olarak e, e, gitmektedir. Bu da haftalık ölüm sayısı ancak e, diğer e, haftalarla kıyaslarken yaslandığında son bu normalleşmeden sonra e, bulaş sayısı arttığı için haftalık e, ölüm sayısı da e, arttı. E, kırmızı renk e, gö kırmızı renk ölüm sayısı, yeşil renk iyileşmenlerin sayısı, mavi yeni bulaş sayısı. Çocuklarda durumumuz e, bugüne kadar 243 vaka görüldü çocuklarda. E, burada da aynı durum. E, erkeklerde, erkek çocuklarda daha az, kız çocuklarında daha fazla oranda bulaş görüldü. E, özellikle 3-6 yaş, 7-11 yaşta oran olarak birbirlerine çok yakın ve 30.3-31.1 olarak oranda bulaş olduğu görülmektedir. Ee, çocuklarda asimptomatik %84.4, semptomatik ise %38, altta yatan enfeksiyon komorbiditesi olan hastalar toplam 14 ta tane olduğu görüldü ve ölüm e, çocuklarda ölüm vakası şu ana kadar bildirilmemektedir. Ancak bu çocuklarda bulaş, aile içi bulaş yani kardeş vakaları daha çok %80'i kardeş vakası olarak görüldü. Hamilelerde bugüne kadar Azerbaycan'da 17 tane hamilelerde gebelerde bulaş e, görülmüştür. Onlardan 6 tanesinde e, doğumda dördü normal dört tanesi normal doğum yapmış, iki tanesi sezeryan. Yeni doğum e, yeni doğ, doğulan çocuklarda bulaş görülmemektedir. Bir, e, ve bir tane e, e, gebe entübe ve Septik şoka girmişti. Daha sonra tedavi olmuştur. İki tane gebemizde düşük olmuştur. Covid pozitif hastalarda. Dokuz tane gebe ise iyileşmiştir ve taburcu olmuştur. Ölüm görülmemiştir e, gebelik e, e, gebe olan hastalarımızda. Bu Azerbaycan'da uygulanan tedavi protokolü sadece bir özellikle asimptomatiklerde e, e, e, e, klorikin, e, hidroksiklorikin 200 mg çarpı 2 sadece doktorun kararı ile gerekirse verilmektedir. Asimptomatik e, hastalarımızda özellikle kullanılmıyor çoğu zaman. E, ya vitamin e, e, e, hocamın anlattığı gibi bir vitamin C, vitamin D takviyesi yapılmaktadır ve arbidolun kullanılması önerilmektedir. Ama asimptomatiklerde dediğim gibi çok fazla bir tedavi verilmemektedir. Diğer ise e, e, COVID-19 artık fenomenisi asimptomatik olan ama ağırlaşmamış hastalarda tedavi protokolü belirilmektedir. Bu Azerbaycan'ın Sağlık Bakanlığı ve Hastane e, Kamu Yönetimi Kurumları diye tabip diye bir kurum var. Onun tarafından oluşturmuş bir tedavi protokolleridir. 
Ve en son zaman konvalisent immunoplazma tedarisine başlanmaktadır. En son 52 tane yoğun bakımda yatan hastalara uygulanmıştır e, e, e, konvalisent immunoplazma. Bunlardan 52 hastaya 60, 64 immunoplazma transfüzyonu yap, yapılmıştır. 38, 52 hastadan 38'inde 11 tanesi hala yoğun bakımda, 27 tanesinde iyileşme görülmüştür, 13 tanesinde ise ölüm görülmüştür. Laboratuvarlara geldiğimizde ise COVID-19 Revitam PCR 25 tane laboratuvarımızda ilk başta bu işi başkent Bakü ile başladık. 16 tane laboratuvara şu an sayı çıktı ama daha önce 16 tane değil 7 tane laboratuvarlarla başlandı. Ama şu an başkentte 16 tane laboratuvar aktif olarak çalışmaktadır. 9 tane laboratuvarlar ise COVID-19 başladıktan sonra PCR laboratuvarları kurulmuştur bölgelerimizde. 10 tane laboratuvarın ise yeni prona, projesi onaylanmıştır. E, ve e, bildiğiniz gibi salgın bizde arttığı için yeni 10 tane laboratuvarların açılması e, önümüzdeki ayda plan, planlanmaktadır. Laboratuvarlara artık buna çok gerek yok ama numune günlük ülkemizde alınan numune sayısı 7 bine yakın numune alınmaktadır. Ve e, bu nazofarynx ve oronfarynx'ten alınan numuneler de sadece yatan hastalarda ve bazen kliniği kesinlikle e, mesela CT yapılan hasta, hastalarda kliniği varsa ancak PCR negatif çıkarsa onlardan balgam örnekleri çalışılmaktadır. Ve en son zaman e, ülkemizde e, serolojik olarak daha önce biz hiç yapmadık. Bu son bir ayda e, İGG e, bakmaya başladık. Yani toplumun ne kadar imunitesi, de, e, imunitesi var diye bunu çalışması yapılmaya başlandı. Laboratuvarda e, laboratuvarlarımız daha çok o, otomatik sistemler üzerinde çalışılmaktadır e, ve PCR'da ekstraksiyon tam otomatik, tam e, full otomatik yani izolasyonda ve e, amplifikasyon e, tam otomatik şekilde uygulanmaktadır. Manuel izolasyondan kaçınılmaktadır. Ve yeni kurulan 10 tane laboratuvarda da aynı şey planlamaktadır. Şu anlık dediğim gibi daha önce de vurguladığım gibi 6 bin, 7 bin günlük PCR yapılmaktadır. Bunu, bu sayının 10 bine çıkarma, çıkarılması planlanmaktadır. 3 ay içerisinde bugüne kadar 450 bin test yapılmıştır. Burada da gördüğünüz gibi başlangıçta mavi renkle işaretlenen olan daha muayene olunmuş örnekler yani alınan örnekler veya muayene olunan örnekler turuncu renk gördüğünüz renk pozitif olanlar Mart'tan sonra hızlı şekilde bir screening yapıldı ülkede yani bölgesel bölgeler olarak hem Bakü'de hem diğer bölgelerde bir toplumun e, e, semptom olsa da olmasa da herkeste Dünya Sağlık Örgütü'nün bir önerisi vardı test test test test diye onu bir e, Azerbaycan'da yapıldı bir screening yapıldı ve burada fark edersiniz e, ne kadar fazla muayene olduysa e, pozitiflik oranı ona göre iniş yaptı ancak şu an e, son bu e, e, Haziran ayında Baya bir yükselme görülmektedir. Burada da gördüğünüz gibi muayene sayısıyla pozitiflik oranlar karşılaştırılmaktadır. Ve dediğim gibi şu anlık test sayımız 7 bine yakın ancak oranımız arttığı için bu sayı 10 bine kadar çıkarmaya planlamaktayız. Ee, çok umut ediyoruz ki en kısa süreçte bu süreç bitecek ve e, normal hayatımıza şartlara döneceğiz. Bu da bizim e, bazı laboratuvar bölgelerden e, bir resim olarak paylaştım. E, laboratuvar takımımız olarak beni dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. Sorular varsa cevaplamaya hazırım. E, Tuğba Hanım çok teşekkür ederim. Müsaaderseniz ben bir hemen soruyla başlamak istiyorum. Ee, Gümrül Hanım çok güzeldi konuşmanız. Çok özlü. Teşekkür ederim. Evet. Ee, antikor çalıştığınız hastalarda prevalans ne kadar çıktı? Hocam çok düşük çıktı. Yani yüksek çıkmadı. Ee, özellikle de şunu vurgulayabilirim. 
Bir mesela Covid geçiren hastalarda da bunu baktık. Mesela 10 hastadan 3 tanesinde negatif çıktı. Bunu başlangıç olarak Covid pozitif olup herkesi bir başlangıç olarak yaptık. Ama baktık baktık ki asimptomatik, hafif semptomatik geçirenlerin çoğunda immunoglobulin G gelişmemiş. Ama daha ağır pneumonisi olan, daha yoğun bakımda yatan hastalardan yani iyileşmiş hastalarda baktığımız zaman IgG pozitif olduğu saptandı. İkinci çalışmayı sağlık çalışanları arasında yaptık. Hastane içerisinde bir baktık. Onları şimdi çalışmasını toparlamaktayız. Ee, ne kadar bir pozitiflik var diye. Onlarda çok düşük pozitiflik çıktı. Yüzde bir, yüzde iki oranda en fazla e, pozitiflik daha önce onların da COVID pozitif olduğu gördüğümüz hastalarda çıktı ama e, genel olarak e, ülkemizde e, IgG pozitifliği çok düşük olarak söyleyebilirim. Bir Aslında tane çalışmada bir... şu an yürütmekteyim. Ben başladım. Bir 300 tane donör taradım. Yani IgG çalışması yapıyorum. Ne kadar olduğu yani rutin donörler arasında da bir bakmaktayız. IgG pozitif olan var mı? Toplam mesela 300 taneden 5 tane pozitif saptandı. Asemptomatiği temsil eder demek istiyorsunuz. Anladım. Evet. Bir Diğer soru, sorry, questions Turkish. Omifenovir ile alakalı deneyim var mı diye soruyor bir arkadaşımız Azerbaycan'da tedavi olarak. Omifenovir evet kullanılmaktadır. Ben tedavi kısmını mikrobiyolog olduğum için çok girmeyeceğim. Yanlış bir cevap da vermek istemiyorum. Ben sadece protokolleri bölüştüm ama bildiğim kadar e, mesela lopinavirle başlayıp sonra tedavi yanıtı görülmezse değiştiriyorlar enfeksiyoncularımız. Öyle bir şeyler yapmaktadılar. Yanlış bir bilgi vermek istemiyorum bu konuda. Ben çok teşekkür ederim. Daha sonra tekrar tekrar görüşeceğiz. Arkadaşlara bırakıyorum sizi. Welcome to Turkey, uh, firstly. Uh, I think we met uh, before and uh, in uh, Turkish infection disease uh, doctors and microbiologists also know you. Uh, we are uh, meeting with you in Congress. Uh, also, you are coming to Turkey, uh, I know. And Dr. Edmund Puka, uh, infection disease specialist, uh, service of infection disease, Mother Teresa from Trian, uh, Albania. Uh, and also consultant of American Hospital uh, and lecture at the Faculty of Technical Medical Sciences. And uh, we will listen your experiences again. Thank you. Yes. Okay. My presentation is to you, so I can I can start. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar, and I would like to start from the Professor Merdar. Uh, stop this uh, connection because some problems. Of uh, other colleagues, in the beginning of the this pandemic situation, we think how uh, the world will change, and. Uh, a change is this uh, uh, way of communication between between us. We have uh, learned to, to to be part of the event conference, but now we need to change. We need that just to to share our, uh, our experience between with the webinar or with the computer. Uh, however, I would like to share some uh, experience from my country and other Balkan countries. Uh, as you know, now the coronavirus disease starting in China and from China uh, in all other the Euro Europe. Uh, how you can change the slides, please? Okay. And uh, as the my neighbors, Dr. Esha Marta Colaneri say, uh, Italy was one of the uh, uh, country that attacked from this disease and the international travels were, were important uh, cause of the infection disease and possibly source of pandemic and the, in February Italy became one of the most uh, COVID-19 affected countries worldwide. Uh, 
thousands of citizens from uh, southern European uh, countries like Albania, Montenegro, uh, North Macedonia, Greece, uh, Croatia, etc., uh, etc., et has a big connection with Italy in, in the sense that many of these uh, people fly or drive back and forth regularly for work and personal travel. So, in the Italy was one of the most uh, important country for these uh, Balkan cities, Bal Balkan countries, sorry. Important cases of COVID-19 have arrived in uh, Balkan countries quickly after the beginning of the outbreak in the region of Lombardy, that is really known, and is uh, part of the Italy. And from the Lombardy, they come here in uh, other countries of the Balkan countries, Balkan parties. Next, please. In this, uh, in this slide, you can see that all the ma majority of cases that are, uh, that are uh, first cases, sorry, the, all the first cases that are uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, in uh, Balkan countries, most of cases have co direct connection or maybe maybe uh, not direct connection with the Italy. For example, Croatia, Greece, North Macedonia and Romania has a really direct connection, both uh, Herzegovina, uh, Albania, absolutely, and Kosovo. And only maybe Slovenia has an, a, a, a case that has been in Maroc and from then pass in Italy and then come in Slovenia. So the most of cases are from, uh, has a uh, strong connection with uh, Italy. And in these data are uh, two months ago and case fatality rates, as you can see, uh, some, some countries like uh, Greece, uh, uh, Bulgaria and Albania to uh, Slovenia has a rate that comes from 0.4 to to point. but in average all in these balkan countries that it's not including turkey is 3.3 next please next slide please please next slide Sorry, do you hear me? There is slide number nine. Yeah, you, you, you can pass. Do you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Please change my slide, please. I can do from my computer. Please, can you change my slide? No, no, no, no. You, you, you, you have passed. No, no, no, no. Which number from slide? Six, six, six, six, please. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. Uh, and, and in these slides, we can see how the number of cases have uh, passed in the uh, yellow, yellow color. We can see the total cases uh, in the number, uh, in the uh, red color is the, uh, Died cases. Please, you you can pass the slide because I have explained in the in the others. 
better because this slide is in Albanian language and so we can pass the other slides. Oh, this, I think that this is an uh, important uh, slide that we would like to share with, uh, with, with other colleagues and with your experience. From the beginning, the number of cases or let's say active cases have start to grow, grow, grow up. And after then, in the mid of uh, March, we start a strict lockdown that in my experience, I, I can say this word because I haven't seen any lockdown experience, uh, but we, I think that the lockdown of this pandemic in Albania was really realistic and maybe have been uh, the most strictly lockdown and the number of active cases has continued in the same level from let's say 230 to 300 and the number has started to down and down but in the uh, beginning of this month in, in, in June, we have uh, to be more liberal with the lockdown and the number of cases actually in the last of two weeks are, have, uh, uh, have rise in a, in, in a strange way, like in the beginning of the Italy, let, let, let's say. So we are in the same situation like Italian have been three, three or four months ago. Please, next slide. Uh, I would like to, to say that uh, uh, infection overall cases, as we can see, no, we not have a big, let's say, big difference based on gender. Uh, male, are, uh, female are, let's say, a little bit uh, more, 53% compared with male in 47%. But I think it's not a big difference between the uh, gender. Now, please. Uh, in this slide, I uh, would like to, to share infected or, let's say, positive cases actually uh, this is uh, a number of the two days uh, ago and we, what we can see that the number of infected or let's say positive cases mostly of them are from 30 age to 60 age so i think that compared with some data before we are to to see now people younger than in the beginning of the pandemic. Next slide, please. And uh, what we can see, I think it's important, and I, I don't like, uh, I, I don't know it's uh, uh, important for, for others, but the uh, mortality, it's in more into female that, than to uh, male. I, I don't know I am correct with the data uh, reported till now, but we have more female died patient than male. Next, please. And here are the mortality cases the, the, depended by age. As uh, you can see, we have only two patients that have died in the younger younger patient, one of them has uh, a lot of uh, other disease like uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, uh, dialysis. And we, we are in the same level. Uh, These data are in a percentage and we have the same level for patient 60 to 70 years and over the and over than 70 years. Uh, so, uh, um, I, I, I think that this, we are in correct data with the other 
colleagues. Next, please. Uh, here it's it's an uh, interesting slide, I think, that tell the seeded cases day by day. Actually, in my hospital are uh, 51 uh, cases that has decide, died, uh, but this slide is prepared two days ago. In beginning of the pandemic, we have uh, a grow a rising uh, death day by day by day and after the lockdown and as you can see the number of decided patients has stayed in the same level 30 from 32 33 and 34 and till now when we started to make more liberal with the lockdown the number of diet patient has grow grow grow up and day by day we are uh, we have two two sometimes three patients that uh, that are dying next please uh, which is the most interesting for here in uh, albania is the cool of new cases in my, my, my country. Uh, as I see, we not have an, uh, uh, a regular curve, I think. I am a physician and maybe I can't explain in, in better way because needed an epidemiologist to, to, to, to, to explain. But the curve have some, some, uh, some value high and some, some down. Maybe this can explain by the uh, evaluation or, or by the number of tests that has in disposition uh, Institute of Public Health in Albania. Uh, or we, we can explain in, the, in another way. But I, I, I think that number of the tampon tested, it is not in a regular way. Next, please. Now, about, about the trend. The data are, are not calculated yet because our, our country is lented to be, an, uh, to, to be a part of uh, uh, international, uh, uh, uh, sorry, international, international study. But in our experience, we have started in the beginning treatment with hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. In some cases, we have used hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin plus aluvia as an antiretroviral. We have used aluvia alone uh, for the antibiotics uh, we have used in most of cases, in most of cases, let's say in 90% of the cases, ceftriaxone plus levofloxacine, uh, dexamethasone. I, we, we need to, to discuss about this topic from the beginning, from the beginning. Next slide, please. From the beginning, we have used methylprednisolone in those two to milligram per kilogram uh, uh, I don't think that the use of dexamethasone or methylprednisolone has some so big benefits that other authors say. Maybe, maybe it's uh, better or it's, uh, let's say, uh, a crucial. I, I, I think it's a crucial uh, treatment, but I not, don't say that it's a uh, uh, meravillous uh, drug. Uh, but what we can uh, debate, uh, we have uh, had a, be, uh, a really uh, strong lockdown in, in, in Albania. But in the end of this lockdown, I, I don't know that he's uh, achieved the goal. The, be, be, because we, we, we now we are in fronting with the same situation that we have in the beginning of the pandemic. The next slide, please. Uh, 
here I would like to share with uh, you some uh, data about uh, uh, absolute uh, number that are in uh, other Balkan areas in Montenegro, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Greece, Croatia, Serbia and Bulgaria. As we can see the number of uh, deaths in, in uh, North Macedonia, I think are really high compared compare with other, other country because the Mac uh, North Macedonia has a population around 1.8 to 2 million people. So the case rate fatality in North Macedonia, that it's a country that has a population compared with Albania, and Kosovo, and Kosovo is, is really high, it's really high. I, I can't explain why this, but then the North Macedonia has been uh, a, a lockdown in the beginning and then the number of cases has started uh, to, to rise when the uh, lockdown has to liberate in the middle of uh, May, I think, in the middle of May. Next slide, please. And here you, you can see in the percentage uh, cases, depending from the colors, in the uh, black that is in the top of the slides are death cases. As we can see, are similar with North Macedonia, Greece, uh, Croatia, and maybe in, in uh, Bulgaria. In the red are positive cases. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, this is uh, my, uh, my first uh, uh, publication uh, in, in this pan pandemic situation, is uh, it was a good collaboration with other uh, authors from the Southeastern European countries. That is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation. Um, is there any, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, okay, I don't uh, Is there a relation to uh, same percentage in North Macedonia and uh, Greece? Uh, which uh, type of uh, relation uh, and which kind of uh, uh, what's the reason to uh, similar results? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. We can explain, let's say, the number of case fatality in, in Greece because the Greece has a population about 10 million. But in uh, North Macedonia, the number of population is about 1.8 or 2 million. So uh, I, I can explain why the North Macedonia has so many uh, death cases, yeah. types cases. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, they has, uh, let's say, uh, a, a lockdown that is happening in other, other parts of the uh, the, the, the Europe mostly, and the number of death cases have uh, uh, start to to rise in the uh, mid or let's say in little. Okay, in what about May, Serbia? Beginning. Serbia, uh, is, Serbia are in in the normal way. Let's say it are in the normal way. Are, are, are, are mm. going in the normal way, but in uh, North Macedonia is uh, is something that I can explain because the North Macedonia has a population compared with uh, us in uh, Albania. We are three three million, there are two million, but they the number of cases in uh, North Macedonia are really too high. 
uh, is there any in data to asymptomatic uh, population uh, in COVID-19 percentage in your mm. country and mm. so there so is Europe? Mm. Uh, here in, in Albania, the number of cases uh, with asymptomatic cases not have really in uh, a, a, a, a data that we can, can share with you. Maybe from the Institute of Public Health that is okay. part of this. Uh, okay. But we are a physician and I, I not have okay. any data to, to be and honest. Sorry, last question. Which kind of preparation to uh, mix uh, season, influenza season to next winter season uh, for COVID-19 in your country and Southeast Europe? Preparation, what prepare, which kind of preparation? Uh, I, uh, I don't, I, I can say what, uh, what I were to prepare for the, for, for the future. Yeah. Uh, is, is, is I, if, if I understand well your, uh, your, your question. Uh, it will be better that we have uh, to, to learn from other, other parts of the world about uh, how to manage this yeah. pandemic. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, had a really strong lockdown in the beginning, but yeah. after then the people are not, uh, not respected. School, for school and shopping center or community uh, area? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah, the people are not to, to, to respect this uh, social dis distance. distance. Thank you very much your, for your nice presentation, well, friends. It's a great pleasure to be in front of you. Thank you. Yes, Toba. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Banu Arslan. Uh, she's from uh, America, USA, uh, Texas University at, at, uh, at, at Dallas. Uh, also from Turkey, we are wondering uh, America, uh, what is happening there? Uh, from and you are uh, living, you are a Turkish person and living yeah. uh, in America. Uh, what is the problem? Uh, we know that America has a, a, a excellent technology. Uh, we want to learn and uh, we want mm -hmm. to listen to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is this has been like you know, such a nice uh, symposium. Uh, today I'll be talking about what really happened in the last four months in the United States. And I'm gonna touch a little bit social, uh, economic and healthcare aspects of the pandemic. Um, so I just wanna start with this, the history of the picture. You are, I think you see guys on the left side. So I was working at a hospital uh, that was located in San Francisco. So recently I'm done with the, uh, the University of Texas and I moved to California and currently I live in the San, uh, Santa Clara, which is uh, well known as um, Silicon Valley. So I was working at a hospital and, you know, the mask issue was really challenging for us. I was able to get only one mask every three days and it was very challenging for us. So I just ordered uh, a fifth mask on the you know, internet. And the day I got my mask, I was super happy, happy. And this picture was taken that day. So let's start with um, timeline, what happened in the United States. Okay, um, so we, uh, the first case was reported on January 20. It was a 35 years old uh, male present to the ER with coughing and uh, shortness of breath. And he has a recent history of traveling to Wuhan, China. So he was tested for, uh, for COVID-19 and he got positive. Uh, but, and then we, you know, we saw a couple of cases, but we actually didn't pay much attention. But on February 19, uh, 20, I'm sorry, uh, February 26, uh, the first community transmission happened in a nail salon in Santa Clara County. And then we learn about the first death on February uh, 29th. And then the same day, uh, there was two more 
uh, cases in the same hospital and one of them was healthcare worker. Um, so, and then we started to get, you know, a couple of death uh, numbers, but actually we didn't pay enough attention. Uh, but on March 4th, uh, California declared emergency, state of emergency because California has the first uh, COVID-19 related death. And then March 13, Trump declared national emergency and schools are closed. And then everything was just turned upside down. Uh, people got panic. And you must have seen that, you know, on the television, people were fighting for, you know, cleaning supplies and everything. Unfortunately, everything was true. I mean, we were at the same, you know, situation almost. I mean, basically everything was, there was a huge lack of shortage of cleaning supplies and uh, the frozen, you know, foods. And then uh, on March 17th, coronavirus was uh, in almost in 50 states and then California, uh, declared shelter in place, which is stay at home order. Uh, first couple of you know, days, we didn't understand what really means that uh, this shelter in place, but my clinic uh, canceled all the uh, you know, office visits. And then we had to call our patients and say that, hey, we you know, shut down the clinic and please keep in touch. And then Medicare and the other uh, insurance companies uh, collaborated with us and they say that we are gonna you know pay for your office uh, for your telemedicine visits and then we started to talk to our patients on the phone and you know started to examine them uh, as much as possible on the phone uh, which means that for us telemedicine has started so I'm gonna talk about telemedicine later because this is super important issue for me and let's you know, move on. On March 26, U.S. was uh, the country who had the most cases in the world. At that time, United States had has um, 82,000, uh, you know, confirmed case, and then it was leading the world uh, in terms of having most COVID-19 cases. On April uh, 21st, we learned that actually uh, coronavirus came early than we thought. Uh, the first death actually occurred in Santa Clara County, which is where I live right now. Uh, she was a 55 years old, healthy female, and she died because of the uh, complications, cardia. Uh, she had a myocarditis, I guess, and then she died of uh, myocarditis. And then on May 3rd, we started to talk about the reopening because economy was really bad at that time. Uh, before COVID-19, United States unemployment rate was around three or four percent, but in uh, April, it was reached up to 16 percent, which means that millions of people lost their job. So this system shelter in place was not sustainable for us, and we started to talk about reopening the economy but in california because you know united states is a huge country we have 50 states and 50 states has different you know um type of uh, restrictions and rules uh, let's move to the other slide so for now uh we have more than 2.5 million confirmed cases in the United States, and that raise our, uh, and we have more than 127,000 deaths. And the most concerning things are numbers are, you know, basically skyrocketing, especially in the last three days. Uh, the the number of the new cases was very concerning, and on June 25th we had. Uh, 40,588 case, which is the highest in a single day. But on the other side, our death numbers was um, kind, it seems like it is under controlled. Uh, let's take a look, uh, you, deaths from coronavirus 
based on the age. Uh, similar to the rest of the world, uh, most of the de deaths occurred in elderly group, but another concerning thing is that we had too much death uh, on the nursing home, uh, especially in New York, they had almost 4,000, uh, you know, death in the nursing homes, which is super concerning. Uh, let's take a look to uh, COVID-19 death rates by age, uh, by race, I'm sorry. Um, so we learned that COVID-19 killed minorities more than other people. So let's take a look the graphics on the left side and you will see how black people affected from COVID-19. Even though uh, the 30% of the US population uh, was African-Americans, but the 23rd percent of COVID-19 deaths in the USA was African-Americans. So uh, let's take a look at the other uh, graphics, which is uh, California's uh, Department of Public Health uh, data. So Latin, uh, Latino people, they actually 38.9% uh, of the population uh, was Latinos, but uh, the 41% uh, of the deaths was occurred in Latin people. So why is this really happening? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. The first thing we know that uh, some of the comorbidities was seen more commonly in minorities. For example, diabetes is very common in Hispanic you know, uh, population and cardiovascular diseases was very common in black people. Uh, but I know you are wondering what really happened in New York. So I'm just going to try to explain, you know, what happened and why this happened to New York. Um, the last cases, uh, actually, for now, it seems like uh, New York was, you know, uh, the coronavirus in New York was under control. Uh, their numbers are going down and their restrictions was due to their strict uh, rules. Uh, but what really happened in New York? During, you know, early March, we started to hear about the COVID-19 cases in the New York, but especially uh, late March, everything was just turned upside down. We started to see refrigerated trucks in front of the hospitals, such as Bellevue Hospital, which is the, you know, most um, which is the oldest public hospital in the United States uh, and in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, we started to solve all these things and we saw that uh, healthcare workers was complaining for not being able to have enough uh, pro uh, PPEs. And then um, FEMA and the National Guard came to help and they you know, established field hospitals. On the left side, the, you know, uh, this one is from one of the field hospitals. Uh, actually, National Guard turned a convention center into a field hospital. And then US uh, Navy sent uh, one of the full equipped uh, medical ships to the New York and hope, thanks to God, they are, uh, they are able to control the numbers right now. But most concerning, uh, the numbers in the south part of the United States is increasing. It is basically skyrocketing, especially the numbers in the Texas, it, it, which is super concerning. There are a couple of reasons why Oklahoma, Texas, or Arizona, Florida has this you know, increasing trend. Uh, I think the most important, you know, reason is being rural and suburban uh, America. And then the second reason is restrictions, uh, because the restrictions varied by states. For example, in Texas, uh, the restaurants was opened or, um, late April, early May. And yesterday they declared that 
they had to close all the restaurants again. Also, there is some life, you know, style differences. It is very difficult, hard to keep people uh, in Florida at home because they have nice beaches and everything and they have an amazing you know, climate. Also, politics has a huge influence on uh, this result. Uh, people made it very politicized. And some of the people, they refuse wearing masks or staying at home, which is not understandable from my, you know, view. Um, so the other, you know, problems was underestimating. So it's the fact that we underestimated the situation. You know, being, uh, living in another, you know, continent doesn't make you feel safe. It shouldn't make you feel safe. But we, when we started to solve uh, the, you know, cases in the China or Italy or in Iran, we didn't got panic, panic match because we feel like we are living another continent and this disease wasn't gonna, you know, spread this much, but we were failed. We were totally failed. And American healthcare system is huge effect on these bad numbers because America has the worst healthcare system among the 33 developed countries. And CDC has a, you know, CDC has a lot of errors. They were late to produce the tests and deliver the tests. So we delayed uh, for testing and lack of coordination uh, is very important. There were no, uh, you know, coordination between the states or the government. For example, uh, when coronavirus hit New York so bad, uh, they were so concerned about not having enough uh, mechanical ventilators, right? And then they were, you know, trying to purchase mechanical ventilators from China. But at the same time, they had to compete with the other 50 states. And then FEMA came, FEMA gave a lot of money to the companies and they got all the, you know, uh, mechanical ventilators. It was, it was, you know, very concerning. It was very wrong. And I hope America has their lessons from this, uh, all these things. But having problems, you know, create solutions. Right. And this is the time of the telemedicine, variable technologies and home health is going to shy in the United States. I mean, before the COVID-19, telemedicine and home health was considered a little bit, um, you know, luxury, but we understand that it is a necessity. So my uh, message about this, you know, presentation is going to be telemedicine. Okay, any questions or any? I don't know. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, I mean, Christian, but um, is it possible the Turkish question and yeah, sure. siz and isterseniz siz onu İngilizce'de açıklarsınız. Ya mm -hmm. ben tabii çok güzel şeyler söylediniz öncelikle. Tekrar tekrar teşekkürler. Böylece mm -hmm. Amerika'yı biraz daha açıkçası sizden dinlemiş olduk. Yani bu kadar büyük ekonomi, bu kadar teknoloji, bu kadar bilim hani her şey oradan biraz yayılıyor falan ama bir de böyle sağlıkta başarısızlık mm -hmm. diyelim bir anlamda. Evet. Hani teknolojiye, bilgiye, bilimin yapılan yatırım acaba insan sağlığına ve insanı iyileştirmeye hemen adanamadı mı, çevrilemedi mi? Yani bu konuda ne dersiniz? Hocam şöyle açıklayayım. Şimdi benim uh, health, uh, healthcare leadership and management'ta da master'ım olduğu için Amerikan sağlık sistemini çok yakından uh, inceleme Harika. fırsatı buldum. Şöyle söyleyeyim, Amerikan sağlık sistemi tamamen kar yapma üzerine kurulu. Ee, tamamen nasıl e, sayıları arttırayım, masrafları kısayım mantığı üzerine çalışan bir sistem. Ayrıca Amerika'da bu public health e, COVID-19 öncesine kadar 
çok konuşulan bir şey değildi. Çünkü public health dediğiniz şey size kar getirmiyor. Burada hmm. e, neler karlı? İşte bir insanı ameliyat etmek karlı. Bir hmm. insanı e, kalbini atıyorum stent takmak karlı. E, bunları da daha nasıl karlı hale getirebiliriz? Hep bu tartışılıyor. Kimse tutup da işte senin hipertansiyonun var bunu takip edeyim. Çabalar var ama kar getirmeyen bir iş olduğu için yeterince kaynak ayrılmadı. İkincisi yine bu uh, Public uh, Department of uh, Public Health'ın başındaki adam kendisi eski bir uh, farmakoloji şey uh, pharmaceutical company'nin CEO'su aynı zamanda da bir lobbyist. Yani bu insanı uh, public health'i anlatmak çok da mümkün olmadı. Bu koronavirüs öncesinde de yine uh, Trump bu public health ile ilgili olan departmanları e, gönderdi. Çok hmm. fazla para harcadıklarını düşündükleri için. Bunların hepsi zaten hani çok münferit olaylar gibi görünse de birbirine çok bağlı. Ayrıca Amerika çok hasta bir ülke. Ve bunun farkında değiller. Düşündüğünüz zaman 2010 ile 2015 yılları arasında diyabete bağlı ekstremite amputasyonları tam iki kat artmış. Yani sen dünyanın en iyi ülkesinin en iyi diyabet ilaçlarını üretiyorsun. Bunu açıklayacak bir teknolojiyle vesaireyle değil. Bu tamamen Amerika'nın kendi bireysel şeyi, bireyselciliği diyeyim. Bunu da çok açık söylüyorum çünkü kendi sınıf arkadaşlarımla da tartıştığım bir şey şu. Sınıf arkadaşlarımdan birisiyle konuştuğumuzda bana şöyle dedi. Bizim için Amerikan rüyası şu. Çok çalışırsın, iyi bir üniversiteye gidersin, iyi bir işin olur ve iyi bir sağlık sigortası satın alırsın. Biz Amerika'da böyle büyüyoruz. Yani tutup da bunu işte e, socialized medicine vesaire bu bize göre değil demişlerdi. Tabii ki koronavirüsten sonra da e, işler değişti. Bu konu üzerine eğilecekler. Özellikle bu e, bahsetmeye çalıştığım bu wearable teknolojilerde... <gülüyor> Gerek Apple olsun gerek Google olsun bu işe giriyorlar. Apple'ın yeni saatlerinden mesela birisi tek derivasyonlu bir EKG çekiyor. Ve siz kendinizi iyi hissetmediğiniz zaman işte oradan kayıt edip yine doktorunuza gönderiyor biliyorsunuz. Johnson Johnson'la bir çalışması var yaklaşık 100 50 bin hastayla atrial fibrilasyonu biz bu saatlerle daha iyi tanıyalım amaçları. Yine Google'ı Fitbit'i satın aldı. Fitbit de diğer bir saat firmasıydı. Bunlar da yine saturasyonu ölçebiliyorlar. İşte biz buradan koahal evlenmesini örneğin daha erken tanıyıp bu insanları acile gitmeden daha iyi nasıl tedavi ederiz? Bunların yolunu aramaya başladılar ama daha işin çok çok başındalar. Çok teşekkür ederim. Gerçekten tam da cevabımı almış oldum. Şimdi diğer bekleyenler açısından ve diğer Tabii, yabancı uzun. konuşmacı arkadaşlarımız için başka soru ya da katkı var mı bilmiyorum. Diğer arkadaşlarımıza yöneltiyorum. Yoksa size tekrar Hı-hı. Ben teşekkür ederim. Bilmiyorum. Bağın Hı-hı. Hanım muhakkak tekrar görüşeceğiz. Çünkü çok arzu ettiğimiz şeyleri çok kısa zamanda özetlediniz. Bir başka zamanda muhakkak Mutlaka. sizi gençliği tekrar dinlemek isteriz. Mutlaka. Haberleşeceğiz. Tekrar tekrar teşekkür <gülüyor> ediyorum. Tuğba Hanım. Ben hocam teşekkür ederim ben de. Ben de sizi dinlerken şunu düşündüm. Hani bu sağlıkta gelişmişlik kriterleri var ya doğum, bebek doğumu hızı filan. Aslında bunların değişmesi gerekiyor herhalde. İnsanların sağlık sistemine ulaşılabilirliği, ulaşabilmesi mesela veya bir pandemi yönetimi gibi bu unsurların da onlara eklenmesi gerekiyor diye düşündüm. Şimdi İngilizceye geçiyoruz. <gülüyor> I, I'd like to introduce Meriç Özgür, Dr. Meriç Özgür. Uh, Romet Klinik uh, Rosenheim. Uh, we are going to Germany and uh, we will listen uh, the German approaches uh, to uh, COVID-19. Welcome. Yes, I want to then some summary um, what happened, um, how were we prepared to this all. Um, like Dr. Banu told, they were not so much They didn't have so much panic because they were far away from Italy and China. For us, it was the opposite way because uh, where I live especially, it is the south of Bavaria. It is a one and a half hour with car to the North Italian border. And uh, after China and North Italy was the third epidemic, epidemic region for World Health Organization is Tyrol, it was the region Tyrol in Austria, and that is only 20 kilometers uh, to us. So 
that was here already big fair because the people here are going for weekends uh, very often to north italy and this period end of february was really the ski skiing um, season where all the south bavarians um, for weekends or for, for one week they've been to italy so that is how it started here and that was that's why we were good prepared in germany because uh, first of all, we were afraid. They showed every day um, what's going on in Italy. And then it came to Ischgl, this uh, holiday regions in Austria. And we were seeing it that it was coming to us. So um, they closed one station when we had no corona and they closed one station for corona patients. And that was for some 10 days empty. We had only two patients that came from Italy and they were without symptoms. And uh, uh, these two guys were sent from the health ministry and they, they didn't want to go to hospital, but health ministry sent them because they didn't trust them that, uh, that they wouldn't stay at home for two weeks. So um, gradually we opened more stations and first two weeks was patients started to come and they were young, they were fit. And when we look at the patients, they were very mild symptoms. Yeah, it was like grippe uh, infection because they were really fit. They were in holiday, these people, they brought it from Italy. And um, it was told consequently then started the um, consequences that they closed um, um, nursing home. Nursing home. Yeah. Nursing home stay closed for, for visitors. And it was prohibited to visit the grandparents for children. These were the first rules that Germany made. Um, so it was a little bit lucky at the start because it was the young people and um, they didn't have contact with the grandparents because in Italy and Spain, they live together with grandparents. That was also the big problem. The problem started here when uh, it went, the virus went to the nursery homes and to dialysis, dialysis. And uh, when the virus went there and then it started really coming uh, old patients then increased the mortality also in Germany because it, at the start it was very low. We had uh, five cases 29th of February and uh, only the 13th of March was uh, 1000 cases approached and at that moment they stopped everything in Germany. So lockdown, um, all the restaurants, cafes, everything possible and schools. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have masks till end of April <laughs> because it was discussion if mask helps or not. It was long discussion um, and it was never a hard lockdown in Germany like in Italy or Spain. We could go out, uh, we could go to any market we want um, and we didn't use masks till end of April. But uh, Merkel was always telling we have to learn to live with virus. So people understood. Yes, it was everywhere the social distance, one and a half, two meters, and uh, everywhere starts the hygiene, cleaning hands and so. And of course, very important, the yeah, grandparents couldn't see their grandchildren for months. Uh, this was a huge protection. We arrived at the top point end of March that I know from my night shift. I had some 29th of March night shift. It was uh, really every 20 minutes was coming a new patient. And when we look back, we see that really 27th of March, we had 7,000 cases. And 2nd of April, also 7,000 cases. It was a top point in Germany. And from 8th of May, we started to have less than 1,000 cases. It was going on good. Really, we decreased till 1, 100 cases, which is because it's really functioning outside. You really see uh, distances that everybody, you know, everybody has masks, masks everywhere and hygiene is good. And it was good under control, but we were sometimes hearing some um, 
meat company had some cases and once in a week was coming news from a meat factory they are cases and that was a point and 17th of june so 10 days ago in northern westfalen this is the state in northwest um in a meat com uh, meat factory there was they told first 400 next day was 700 1000 and it was 1400 workers infected they had 8000 workers so that was the first city who had the second lockdown because german has a rule for a lockdown it has to be then over 50 cases in 100,000 population and uh, Gütersloch, this city they had 133 cases pro 100,000 so at that uh, region they closed again everything restaurants schools and so and um, but hardly most hard was in Bayern uh, in Bavaria especially where I work uh, is the fourth most seen it's Rosenheim. It is after after Berlin, Munich, um, Hamburg. These are million cities, and Rosenheim is only sixty-five thousand. Uh, but it was the fourth most scene of coronavirus. It's because of geography, geographical location. We are close to the North Italy and the Austrian part, which was exploded the infection. And um, there was one mistake which is made. Uh, there was a beer festival on the seventh of March. Uh, ministry had ministry of health told don't do it and the city made it started 7th of march uh friday and the uh, 10th of monday they closed it because the cases were going more and more and uh, probably in that festival already it was open for three days and uh, it caused them spreading here in bavaria we have now from um i have uh, Data from yesterday: 192,500 cases, almost 50,000 is in Bavaria. Um, at the start was a general rules. Every week they sat together. Um, uh, Merkel and uh, some uh, ministers of some uh, states. Um, and after some five, six weeks, is decided, then the states will decide their, themselves. That means. Every state has now different rules because every state has different um, corona cases. And uh, Bayern was everything doing one week later because we have more cases than that. Um, for example, you could contact, let's with five people here, and uh, it became now 10 people. And in Turingen, the state in the middle, north, um, there is no contact limitation, for example. There are different rules in um, every different state. So um, in Germany is an um, important Robert Koch Institute. Um, all the data on the um, um, suggestions are uh, declared from them. And um, so, at, if I want to, if I tell about um, therapy, um, no therapy is actually now um, accepted in Europe. To tell the truth, in Germany, um, they recommended or not recommended so as therapy there is an antiviral therapy or immunomodulator yeah and at these antiviral therapies only suggested from robert Koch institute is uh, remdesivir that's the only one and none of the other medica med medicaments drugs are suggested and rem remdesivir is a good outcome at the, the patient who has oxygen yeah where do we need oxygen so we don't know at intubated patients or mild patients about this um there was a need now no fixed therapy at, at us um, so hydroxychloroquine it was giving uh, severe patients so medium or severe patients we tried it and uh, uh there is no good outcome uh, they were mostly dying really uh, uh, and who didn't got it was mild and they survived so and we made the uh, general rules, I think all the world made that don't give so much fluidity because yeah, it's making bad the oxygenization at the IRDS and uh, steroids. We didn't give also because it decreases the viral clearance and can cause fungal infections. 
this immunomodulator, yeah, interleukin-6 inhibitor. We tried it also, yeah, because um, at several patients, we saw it also at, at, at labor that interleukin-6 was high, uh, didymere was high, um, LDH is high, uh, ferritin was high. You saw it at young patients when they were high. These, it was certain, but uh, these young patients were really then intubated. intubated. Um, so this uh, interleukin-6 uh, tocilizumab, yeah, it is. It's not. Re just, um, it is not recommended because it is also causing bacterial uh, super infections that we lead then increasing the poor calcitonin level and um, and no infiltrations in the lungs. Um, so why it was different than the Italy, Spain, and France that we have uh, less deaths or is, is because we saw it, we were good prepared, and um, we were lucky that the first infected people were young, who was on holiday really there. And, uh, and we were in Italy, Spain, there are houses that grandparents are living together with grandchildren. Here it's not so uh, often, and it was anyway prohibited here, because I want to show some statistics groups and then I will finish it. Um, so, um, here, here are some uh, interesting that from the 192,500 patients was documented, 30% was uh, asympt um, asymptomatic. So, um, it was just, they were just tested, there are no symptoms. And uh, 57,155 patients, that's 30%, uh, they were asymptomatic in Germany. When I saw the other um, countries, women were more infected in Germany, also 52% women more infected. And um, youngs were more infected also. So age of 20 till 50 years were 44%, and 50 to 70 years were 31 percent. So, um, seven years and high was only 13 or 13 percent. But who died was 86 percent over the age of 70. Under age of under the age of 20, died only three patients who had already known diseases. About the symptoms BHP. in Germany. Sorry, right? HP. Yavaş yavaş toparlayabilir miyiz? Ee, evet. Eğer mümkünse 20 dakika doldu aslında. Ee, bir iki konuşmacımız daha olacak. Arzu ederseniz bir kısa özet de yapabilirsiniz. Ama ilave eksiklikleri söylemek istediğiniz varsa lütfen bölmeyin de. Yo, son olarak e, toplam 14.640 yoğun bakım hastasının %25'i, e, yani 3.707'si e, Türkçe'ye geçti. Pardon. E, vefat etti Almanya'da. E, Pazartesi'ne itibaren de yeni kurallar geliyor. E, 20 metre kare başına bir insan e, izin verilirken şu an 10 metre kare başına bir insan bir mağazaya gelebilecek. Teşekkür ediyorum. Ben çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bir soru var. Hem de bir açılım sağlar. Biliyorsunuz çoğu e, Alman vatandaşı ama Türkiye'de yani Türk işçisi, emekli olanlar var. Bir kısmı orada yaşıyor, bir kısmı geliyor falan. Onlar tekrar Almanya'ya dönecek olurlarsa ne tür bir hazırlık var? Nasıl onlarla ilişkili konular? Ve bir de yani Türkiye'nin an... salgı yönetimine Almanya'dan bakışı nasıl? İkinci ya soru. An, e, Almanya'da hala yüksek görülüyor Türkiye'deki oranlar. Sınırlayı aşmayı hala düşünmüyorlar. E, çünkü bakıldığı zaman Türkiye'deki rakamlar da 700'lere inmişti. Tekrardan 1600'lere çıktı. Evet. O yüzden Avrupa Birliği şu an sınırlarını kendi arasında açtı. Ama Avrupa Birliği dışında şu anda herhangi bir karar çıkmadı. En son biraz susa kadar uzatmışlardı. 
Şu an herhangi bir karar yok. Ama enfeksiyon sayıları yüksek görülüyor şu an Türkiye'de. Peki Almanya'da ki insanların bir kısmının tatilleri ve yazdıkları İspanya'da. İspanya'ya evet. tatile gidecekler mi? Ya evet Mallorca, Mallorca'ya gittiler yani 10 bin kişiyi alacağını açıkladı Mallorca. Yaklaşık 2-3 haftaları gidiyorlar. Şu an herhangi bir enfeksiyon geri dönüşü olmadı. Çok teşekkür. Yani burada bir de kafe ve restorana gidildiği zaman detaylı olarak isimlerinizi alıyorlar. İsim, telefon, adres. Bilmiyorum Türkiye'de de oluyor mu? Bu şekilde 3-4 restoranda vakalar tespit edildi ve o andan itibaren 3 gün içerisinde ziyaret eden insanları da karantinaya, karantinaya aldılar. Çok konuşulacak şey var ama zaman kısıtlı ve artık gecenin ilerleyen saatlerinden dolayı diğer bekleyenler açısından da tekrar tekrar teşekkür ediyorum. Bilmiyorum diğer arkadaşlarımın sorusu, katkısı olur mu Tuba Hanım, Mehmet Bey? O zaman teşekkür ediyoruz. Ve ben diğer konuşmacı arkadaşımız ya, için Tuğba Hanım'a sözü bırakıyoruz. Ya da Mehmet Bey'e artık onlar daha iyi bırak. Çok teşekkürler tekrar. Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Kaya Suar. Uh, he's from uh, Cyprus uh, near East University. And we know that Cy Cyprus uh, has many connections with Europe, with England. And also it is a university city. There are uh, country, there are many, many students from Turkey and uh, we want to learn what is happening in uh, Cyprus. Yes, welcome. Hello. A very good night to everyone. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to Mustafa Altintish uh, for the invita invitation, and I would like to give you some uh, knowledge about the Cyprus experience about uh, COVID-19. In the, uh, we look at to the back in 1967. William Stewart says something. Uh, he said they closed the infectious disease book. But the uh, World Health Organization, World Health Organization 2019 report say that the infectious disease is, is still is important for the all of the world. As you know, in the uh, worldwide, uh, the date uh, causes is contains a lot of infectious problems. Uh, in this period, if you look at we see the numbers of the COVID-19 in this point is very close to malaria infection. In COVID-19 patients, first of all, seen in the 9 March in the uh, Northern Cyprus. Before this date, we start to follow what's happening in the world uh, and st uh, try to prepare the, our community to, uh, against the uh, COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. Before this date, Ministry of Health and the uh, UDAC make the, a lot of meetings uh, to make the uh, decided precautions. And also we gave the, a lot of training to our students and the community and the about the, and then the community awareness is raised and the detection of the infrastructure deficiencies and the measures uh, Uh, talk in uh, for the uh, uh, against the pandemic and the that uh, shadows are made and also uh, the Turkish Republic Northern Cyprus Prime Ministry uh, science board is created in 9 March and uh, I'm the member of the, this uh, science board also in this period uh, I found this uh, graphic about the uh, end of the February. In this period, uh, when we look at to Italy, the patient numbers about 10,000 in this period. Uh, what's happened in the Italy? And also we checked the Singapore and Hong Kong because they are also island like us. That's why what's the difference between them? What we, what we can, what kind of precaution we can take? Uh, 
uh, I gave this information in the uh, science board meeting and uh, I said we must uh, be ready against the uh, outbreak uh, we mustn't uh, uh, increase we mustn't with the more than healthcare system capacity patients and then the, in northern Cyprus we start to take some progression in the 16 day of the epidemic in Italy what happened the government uh, start to uh, quarantine and about 60 million Italian which is living in the north of the Italy and then decided to make measures that due to restrictive measures covering the whole uh, Italy, Italy country all countries travel in the north of the Italy is restricted because but they are delayed uh, except for special circumstances and symptomatic ones were encouraged to stay home and limit social contact and consult their doctors and the people's avoidance of the communities all schools and universities are closed they take a lot of measures I will not say all of them uh, when we look at uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, like the other islands like us, in Hong Kong, schools quickly closed and quarantine started with the first uh, diagnosed patients. And the community sensitivity was too high in this period. In 12 March, they have only 129 cases and three deaths. And 22 June, their numbers of the patients is a little bit increase they have only five deaths in singapore very serious quarantine and the uh, uh, meticulous communication tracking is started in the march 178 cases there, there is no death but in this period the numbers of the cases is increased as you know in northern cyprus in this period in the 9 march uh, our uh, Prime Minister Science Board decided to uh, close the lockdown to all borders, all schools, hotels, restaurants, malls, and the uh, association locals, mosques, and the others. That means lockdown start very quickly with the first patients. And the partial curfew was also used, and the quarantine application is started. Mistakes made by the Italian were not made in the northern Cyprus. And also in our university, we start the mathematic modeling uh, study against the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And also we publish this one. In this uh, article will be explained tomorrow afternoon at 9, at 2 o'clock by Nazife uh, Sultanoglu, our doctors from the university. In the mathematical modeling, as you know, the stability of the equilibrium points was de determined by the magnitude of the basic reproduction numbers, R0. If the R0 less than 1, the disease eventually disappears. And R0 is more than 1, the presence of an epidemic is stated. Uh, Ray 0 uh, when we follow the, the outcome in the northern Cyprus, is between the in the maximum range was 2.38. It was start to decrease, and the 24 of the April, our uh, rate zero value is less than one. Which means we take the under the control the outbreak in the northern Cyprus. First first cases came from the Germany, one of the members of the trees group and the, in this uh, study we have only 108 patients about 30 to 33 patients of them from German and also we with the automatic model we use the same model we follow the uh, R0 levels every day and then we decided to we will see maximum between the 120, 140 patients. Uh, end of the one month of the, after the first case, uh, we uh, take the under the control 
the earthquake in the uh, in, in the northern Cyprus. Totally, we saw 108 cases and four deaths. The Carantina Hospital is the government hospital, Dr. Buhan Malbanto uh, government hospital, uh, decided by the government. And uh, since April 17, we, we don't see any no more new cases. COVID-19 outbreak taken under the control in 25 June. There is no uh, new patients and total patients still 108 patients in our country. And also, this is the current situation of COVID-19 in Northern Cyprus mathematic model. And it's, it's situation of the uh, COVID-19 in Northern Cyprus. Another uh, short research communication. Uh, this uh, article is published uh, preprint uh, in the one of the World and Health Organization uh, journal. As you know, the uh, Cyprus is divided in 1974, two parts, south and, uh, south and the northern Cyprus. As you know, the northern Cyprus is not uh, recognized uh, by the other countries. Uh, this this, way, the, this article is important for us because this article is related uh, published in the World Health Organization uh, journals. And the South Cyprus also, the in the same period with us, the uh, outbreak is start, and the, they have still some patients. Totally, they have 985 patients diagnosed, and the and 26 that seen in the South, South, South, South Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Another uh, study, uh, we make the one of the survey. We prepared one of the survey. I would like to give the, a lot of, uh, I will not talk about, about this one too much because it's preparing still and also the time is too late. Uh, I will give you the situation uh, about the general level of you know, knowledge in the uh, Northern uh, Cyprus community and university students. General knowledge of all participants was found to be 47.39. Uh, Use the three point decay scala between the 40 and 40, 58 describes a good information level about the COVID-19 and in, uh, 19 infection. And also a general preparation level we checked. Uh, I'm, I'm giving the first two to, uh, important topic. Uh, we use the five point uh, recast color. 4160 described the good preparation levels in the general preparation of all participants, community and university students was found to be 45.97, which is the good progression level in the our community and university students. As you know, in the Northern Cyprus, we have the uh, a lot of uh, foreign students, uh, more than 100 countries, uh, students we have in the Northern Cyprus. After the index case, index case in the uh, Northern Cyprus, major is taken and the audit is started and the public awareness and the harmony uh, and the making good use of the country advantages and the Northern Cyprus has reached a safe country position. Thank you very much. I speak very, very fast because the time is too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kasuer. Uh, uh, is there any preparation of uh, this summer for touristic uh, activities in hotel or etc.? Okay, now uh, the between the south and the north, the borders is open. People can go and come back, but we there is uh, some rules used in the uh, Cyprus. In the both sides, the people must show the PCR results. Uh, mm -hmm. It must be taken uh, at least three days before, maximum three days. Uh, and also, uh, if somebody wants to come to our country, uh, will when they arrive to uh, border, 
uh, our healthcare uh, workers will take the samples and uh, with until the results of the samples they will stay in the hotel or home somewhere and they will give an address to our uh, healthcare uh, system until the results they must make the use the isolation in their hotel or home if the test is negative they can uh, move somewhere in the northern Cyprus. Thank you very much. Uh, Güzel bir konuşmaydı ama kısa zaman ileride daha geniş ümit edelim konuşuruz diye düşünüyorum. Biraz, hocam. biraz kısa kestik çünkü vakit çok geç geçti diye. Çok doğru çok ilerledi tekrar teşekkür ederim. Tuğba hocam Mehmet hocam sorularınız ilaveniz var mı katkınız var mı? Yok kısa. Mikrofonlarınız kapalı galiba. Yoksa Mesut Mardani. Evet. Mesut Mardani evet. davet edebilirsiniz. Yes. Mesut Mardani, uh, again, uh, welcome. You waited uh, now uh, 2 a.m. Uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, you are waiting. Uh, yes, we are listening. Uh, I will start <laughs> with the number. Uh, do you have a uh, please? I don't know. Is, did you receive my uh, with inter, uh, via internet or not? We can see okay. your presentation. There is no problem. Thank you so much, very much. I I will start with the uh, Iranian cases of COVID-19 uh, has been diagnosed uh, in uh, 18, 2020 from Qom. It's a city uh, 150 kilometers far away from Tehran southern part of Tehran and after that the Tehran and Bash and uh, other provinces has been uh, has been uh, infected with uh, patients immediately if you want to see uh, this is our uh, Iranian uh, you can see uh, we have some provinces in the a white uh, bar and another with the uh, red and some of them with yellow. Uh, uh, most of the, our uh, new cases was from Qom, Tehran, uh, Mazandaran and we had uh, another um, this uh, slide Unfortunately, it's written in, in Persian, but we had the prevalence study. We had more than 84 points uh, prevalence of COVID with T. Dr. Mardani, can you hear me? Aptan düştü hocam, Mardani hocamız. Hocam, nasıl? Mardani hattan düştü şu anda. Tekrar bağlanıyor. Okay. E, takip ediyorum. Takip ediyoruz. Yeah. Do you have my voice? Yes. yes. We can hear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, if you want to know the numbers uh, from the beginning of the epidemic till two days ago, we had something like 215,000 
confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 in our country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 10,130 cases uh, has been died and uh, around uh, between 2,000 and 2,500 cases, new daily case we have. And, but fortunately, we have something like 1,000, uh, one, uh, uh, eight country uh, country all in the all over the world from the number of the recovering patient and this is a success of the treatment of our patient may I have the next slide please in the second uh, slides you can see uh, the Iranian strategy control uh, from the beginning of the epidemics the national screening of more than 70 million Iranian population with social media has been down. Iranian health, uh, strong Iranian health network all over the country uh, the, co cooperated very, very uh, tightly with the patients. In the peak of the epidemics, uh, we advise people not to come to the hospital in case of asymptomatic or mild cases of COVID. A good cooperation between the public health system and university hospital was one of the important issues. Next slide, please. In the next slide, please, uh, that you can see uh, COVID-19 surveillance in Iran in the uh, blue bar. Uh, this is the number of the patient who has been admitted in the hospital. In the, uh, in the uh, orange uh, bar, you can see community treatment center. And the yellow bar, you can, you, you can see the number of the patients from 18th of February till mid of the, uh, May, the, that we had uh, uh, something like 5,000 cases uh, who uh, supervised in the, their homes. Next slide, please. If you want to know, next slide, please. Yes. If you want to know home care and community treatment center, we activated 1,200 COVID treatment center with facility of sampling and test diagnostic material and, uh, and uh, uh, physicians. Uh, admission of the moderate to severe cases in the hospital has been done and uh, uh, at least 4,000 ICU beds uh, has been activated. Uh, in, for uh, Iranian hospital for critically ill patient in Iran. Next slide, please. Uh, if you want to know, we did some research project uh, for the treatment of our patient in Iran. One of them uh, is the effect of the remdesivir in COVID-19 patient. Uh, as our colleague right. told us the, regarding the treatment, this is the uh, nine cases that have been treated uh, in the two months of the first ep of the uh, ep epidemics in Iran, red uh, bars uh, are died patient and green bars are survived. From 59 patients, 13 patients unfortunately uh, died. Uh, but uh, we have a good experience with the results of the remdesivir. If you started remdesivir in the early of infection, at least. Uh, in the beginning of the disease, in the uh, first week of the treatment, if you start remdesivir, you will be benefit more than the uh, starting uh, remdesivir in the late stage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you want to know uh, regarding the efficacy and immunogenicity of tocilizumab in Iranian patient with uh, COVID-19, uh, next slide, please. We had, uh, we have uh, a study team. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a, sl a, st a study uh, team. Uh, the principal of, uh, of investigator is Payam Tabarsi, one of my colleagues, uh, with more than 10 co investigators in seven cities. And they worked, next slide, please, uh, on, a, uh, on a next slide, please, on a clinical trial. You can see uh, in, the, in this clinical trial authorization. That has been done with Ministry of Health and Medical Education in Iran. Next slide, please. The results of the uh, efficacy and uh, ne next slide, please. And the lab and clinical result analysis of drug side effects in tocilizumab severe or critical COVID patient 
has been shown here. If you want to see regarding the oxygenation in severe patient, 92% uh, res uh, uh, responded to the treatment and the critical patient, 69% uh, uh, responded to treatment. Uh, from, for the uh, recovery of the interleukin-6 level, 67% uh, in severe patient and 60% uh, in critical patient uh, has been recovered the number of the interleukin level. Uh, if you want to see uh, oxygen saturation, uh, for example, 100% of the patient uh, in severe cases and 89% of the critical cases, uh, be, uh, an, an oxygen became normalized after the treatment with tocilizumab. CRP in severe patient responded in 63% and uh, uh, in critical patient only 22%. For the body temperature normalization in critical patient 70%, but in the severe uh, patient 64 uh, patient. Uh, in all the patients that uh, they tried, they had only two hypertension uh, drug side effect and one uh, oral herpes and one blister. Uh, may I have next slide, please? You can see in the next slide, you can see the, the effect of the tocilizumab uh, and in, uh, for um, their outcome analysis uh, between 116 uh, patients that were critically ill or severe uh, patient with COVID-19. Uh, uh, unfortunately, 28 of them, uh, they died. 84 discharged with good condition and uh, the hospital uh, admission has been continued in four. Uh, for example, if you want to know, uh, next slide please, uh, you can see the green bar is the severe patient and the red bar is critical patient. 86% uh, of the severe patient and 48% of the critical patient responded uh, positively to the tocilizumab. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to talk something regarding the ivermectin. Ivermectin is the antiparasitic drug. FDA approved uh, in It has, it has FDA approval for the uh, parasitic with nuclear import of uh, Importantly, it has been demonstrated uh, uh, by RNA viruses such as encephalitis virus and influenza. Slide, please. This is the article that you can see. Next slide, please. Uh, article that uh, showed you uh, the FDA approval of the ivermectin uh, for the, of the replication of the SARS CoV virus in vitro. Next slide, please. There you can see uh, ivermectin. Slide, please. You can see ivermectin is a potent inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2 virus in clinical isolate in vitro. Next slide, please. If we want to conclude regarding next slide, please. Uh, regarding ivermectin, uh, it is uh, has a potent antiviral action against. SARS-CoV virus uh, in clinical isolate and single dose at the early application within 24 to 84 hours. Personally, I will treat uh, some of the uh, patients who don't want to ad be admitted uh, with, uh, with uh, symptomatic patient with the uh, antiviral drug and uh, and uh, ivermectin and uh, uh, i believe that this uh, drug can do something for the inhibition of the viral replication in the patient and next slide please this is the uh, the uh, the covid-19 and use of ivermectin is associated with lower mortality in hospitalized patient this is a, a, a, a an article uh, from uh, Florida International University. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the, another uh, in the uh, next uh, slide, you can see 
uh, the open label retrospective cohort study of hospitalized patients uh, in uh, South Florida uh, and the mortality differences was significant between the uh, two cohorts that they have uh, in patients uh, who have been on ivermectin or not. Next slide, please. So uh, we believe that we need a randomized controlled trial study of uh, ivermectin for uh, COVID-19 infection, uh, and it is one of the necessity for the uh, uh, country to, uh, which have a patient with uh, uh, COVID-19. And we have one RCT uh, underway just now in Iran, and uh, we can show the effect of the ivermectin uh, in uh, near future. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see uh, we have been participated in COVID-19 therapeutic solidarity trial by WHO. Uh, in five hours, we randomized a uh, control trial in Iran. Uh, one uh, we, uh, with standard care, another with standard care plus uh, remdesivir, standard care plus hydroxychloroquine or uh, chloroquine, uh, uh, a standard care of uh, Caletra, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, another standard care with uh, Caletra and beta interferon. And uh, it, all of them uh, are coming in as a research project. You can see here, participating hospital in Iran in 15 province, 24 hospital, and 27 principal investigators, 38 randomizer and total 65 clinicians has been participated in this uh, trial. Next slide, please. You can see the uh, Iranian map. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can see the active hospital in Iran uh, with the research project in the uh, treatment of the patient with COVID-19 in Iran. Next slide, please. Uh, a few countries uh, uh, uh, next slide, please. You can see has been participated in the solidarity uh, project. Number of the COVID patients enrolled in the per country. Uh, this is uh, from two or three weeks ago. Uh, R&D blueprint of the WHO. Iran uh, has the maximum uh, participating COVID patient enrolled uh, in these trials. And uh, after uh, us, France. And after that, Spain, and after that, is uh, Indonesia uh, as, uh, are participating in this project. Next slide, please. Uh, some idea uh, from the next slide, please, from solidarity trial we have. Next slide, please. Uh, we want to know uh, the unanswered question about our randomized control trial. Uh, it, uh, they are very important for public health uh, uh, importance and for the clinician, especially regarding the hydroxychloroquine. Uh, everybody knows that the hydroxychloroquine, uh, in the uh, many articles, they uh, uh, named as its useless drug uh, for the treatment of the hydroxychloroquine. We have some trial that we want to compare uh, hydroxychloroquine in the uh, in the patient not admitted hospital. In admitted hospital, we found it is not effective drug, but in the, uh, in the OPD patient, sometimes we will use it. Uh, another drug that we will use is the lopinavir retronavir uh, the, with the name of Caletra. Uh, we, uh, sometimes we use it uh, alone, sometimes we, we will combine with other drugs. Other drugs like interferon, uh, beta, uh, with uh, atazanavir or uh, lopinavir, ritronavir, or, or caletra. Sometimes you will use uh, remdesivir with uh, lopinavir, ritronavir, or atazanavir, or sometimes you will use interferon with remdesivir. So uh, we will have uh, all the uh, arms in our uh, trials. Next slide, please. And uh, our context, uh, next slide, please. Our context, uh, for example, for hydroxychloroquine, uh, is it uh, most uh, indicate it, it is an up, uh, obstacle for recruitment? Lopinavir retinavir will recovery release result, results soon. 
for interferon, we have uh, uh, at least more than 200 uh, research That's projects on interferon uh, in all over the country. Remdesivir, uh, Gilead is advancing uh, negotiation uh, and widespread uh, expanded access. Uh, but our uh, uh, study will soon uh, be uh, uh, part of the uh, SOC, so standard of the care, uh, absence of the mort uh, mortality data. But everybody knows that uh, in the trial that uh, has been published in New England Journal of Medicine, Remdesivir uh, has decreased the, uh, long, uh, the, uh, the hospitalization from 14 days to 10 days, and we found uh, this uh, data in our patient too. Next slide, please. This is, uh, next slide please. This is our baseline characteristic of patient in hydroxychloroquine and the standard of the care. Uh, we will uh, continue it. Uh, WHO uh, uh, canceled this uh, project, but we will continue it because we want to uh, use it uh, in uh, our project. Okay. Next slide please. This is uh, the uh, comparison of the hydroxychloroquine with the standard of the cave. You can see here, a standard of the cave acts better than the, in the admitted hospital than the hydroxychloroquine. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is another, next slide, please. Uh, this is another slide that we can, next slide, please. Can, you can uh, show you hydroxychloroquine versus local standard of the cave. Two main trial reported deaths before discharge. One of them is uh, solidarity and, uh, and uh, or within uh, 28 days in the recovery trial. Next slide, please. So uh, we are dealing with a lot of the useless drug uh, for the uh, treatment of the uh, COVID patient, but we have to do the best that we can do it. Remdesivir is one of them, interferon is another one. And, uh, uh, and the antiviral drugs, hydroxychloroquine and other drugs. May I, next slide please. Okay, this is the interaction report uh, and uh, with treatment and co-mediators for interferon beta and the uh, antiviral drug. Next slide please. Uh, I have, uh, uh, two or three slides, the next slide please, regarding the prolonged sickness with coronavirus for more than 16 days. 60 days, the virus involves uh, many parts of the body from the brain to toes, and some symptoms may be due to damage to different organs that have not repaired themselves. Patients describe everything from a decrease in lung function to persist loss of taste and a small or profound fatigue. Next slide please. Uh, another problem that we have is prolonged, uh, profound exhaustion and sleep problem. Post viral syndrome has been associated with the numerous viruses uh, in the past, uh, but until the pandemic, they will consider relatively rare. Uh, in, this, in the case of COVID 19, researchers uh, are unsure uh, whether people with, uh, with the extended symptoms are simply facing a long recovery or whether their illness will come to their resemble something like a complex illness characterized by profound exhaustion or sleep disorders. We, I personally have a lot of patients with uh, sleep disorder after the getting uh, COVID infection uh, or other condition can last at, uh, uh, for months, even uh, years or maybe in the lifetime. Uh, we've been renamed as uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Next slide, please. So we are, we will, we will be waiting for the uh, for a, we will be waiting for a development of a cycle of vaccine from lab to clinic and uh, hope uh, we can have uh, an an infectious vaccine in near future uh, for the uh, immunized uh, our population and uh, other population in all over the world. Uh, I think uh, my time is over. Uh, yes. If you have any question, I will be ready uh, to answer them. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for your uh, patience.
Thank, Thank you. you very much uh, for your nice presentation. I think. Uh, Dr. Mardani, uh, one question, I have one question, special question, not medical area. How would you able to use Remdesivir under the ban of United States of America? Professor Mesut? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, yes. uh, in the beginning of the beginning of epidemic, we had uh, some uh, donation from the China, rem, um, Chinese made remdesivir. Even they didn't have any label on it, but we used it after that uh, in the solidarity. Ses gelmiyor. Uh. Professor Mardani. Dear Professor Mardani. Maybe write a message. Um, değerli hocalarım, e, şöyle ekrana baktığında Kaya hocam var. E, sizler varsınız. E, ve bir grup Dinleyici arkadaşımız var. Mehmet Hocam, hiç konuşmadınız. Kapanışı siz yapın. <gülüyor> Uykularımız ben... geldi diyorsun. Kaya Hocam, söyleyeceğiniz bir şey var mı? Aslında size bir soru vardı ama kaçtı diye ben soramadım. Diyor ki, tedavi protokolünüz nedir? Kaya Hocam, duyuyor musunuz? Mikrofonunuzu ee, açarsanız. Du duyuyorum hocam. Ee, dediğim Buyurun. gibi, karantina hastanesi e, devlet hastanesi olarak kabul edildi. Biz tanı evet. koyduğumuz hastaları e, devlet hastanesine sevk ettik. Ama burada uygulanan tedavi hidroksiklorokin, azitromisin, e, interleukin 6 inhibitör artı ve e, daha sonra da favipravir geldi. Şu anda uygulanan tedaviler bununla. Ko Hayır. İmmin plazma için e, bir proje biz verdik ama henüz daha bir cevap almadık. Ama bildiğim kadarıyla kan bankasında plazmalar toplanmaya başlandı devlet hastanesinde. Elinize sağlık. Ama hiç yeni... uygulamadık. Evet. Teşekkürler. Yayınlarınızı gördük bu arada. Tebrik ederiz. Elinize sağlık. Teşekkürler. Başarılar sağ diliyoruz. Sağlıklar diliyoruz. Evet. Mehmet Hocam. Ben e, tüm katılımcı hocalarımızda sesim geliyor mu? Geliyor. Tüm katılımcı hocalarımıza sunumlar için ayrı ayrı teşekkür ederim. Gecenin bu saatine kadar canla başla, heyecanla dinleyicilerimiz de aynı şekilde onlar da bizi yalnız bırakmadılar. Dünyanın değişik yerlerinden takip ederek bizi onurlandırdılar. Güzel bir sunum oturum oldu. İnşallah bunların devamını gelir. Başta tabii Mustafa Hocam çok emekleri var. Tuğba Hocam'a da teşekkür ederiz. Bütün Beraber katılımcılara iyi geceler diliyoruz. Hepsine teşekkürlerimizi sunuyoruz. Yeter. Tuba Hocam. Ben de size Tuba Hocam ilaveniz. Evet hocam size çok teşekkür ediyorum. Öncelikle ben Tabii. gerçekten çok Beraber güzel bir şey. toplantı oldu. Ben de bu Covid sonrası inşallah hani e, bir değişim olur dünyada. İnsanlar arası iletişim artar diye düşünüyorum. Dünyayı korumaya e, çalışırız. Ve her şey güzel olur. İnşallah hani bunun pozitif etkilerini de görürüz diye düşünüyorum. Ben herkese çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bütün katılımcılara. Kaya Hocam'ı görüyorum burada. Mehmet Hocam size de çok teşekkür ederim. Saygılarımı sunuyorum. Arkadaşlar ben de size çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ve gecenin bu saatinde bizi hala mutfakta takip eden teknik ekibe de tekrar teşekkür ederek bugün akşamı kapatıyoruz. Yarın 12'de söz sunularda buluşmak dileğiyle. Herkese tüm katılımcılara teşekkür ediyorum. Hayırlı geceler. <gülüyor>